All right, peoples, this is yeah. Playing in Traffic, and we are live on YouTube. Where else? YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Twitch. Yeah, Twitch. there you go. We got the boys in the house. Terry, what's happening? Yo, what's going on, Indeed. everyone? I'm, I'm going to say, I'm right down there, right? <laughs> I'm doing the Brady one thing, right? Chris is upstairs. Yes, <laughs> He's upstairs yeah, to the right on mine. You know, we got the cast of characters that Louis Lee bringing it, you know. We got Ray Garino, Mo Mouth Radio, <laughs> and of course we got a special, down here, right? there special go. guest, the Madman. And I'm going to explain to you why he's a Madman. He and you, and you you're not going to believe it. My man Richard Holdner, yo, say what's up to the people, hard people. What's up, up man? There. What's up to the audience? How are you guys doing? Happy <laughs> right. Thursday, right? Yes, sir. Hey, we appreciate you having you on, man. Uh, oh, fan, fan, thank been, you guys, man. I'm a big fan. You know, we talked like two years ago about getting you on the show. Sorry it took so long, but you know, Terry is always hogging up the space. I was gonna say that's I was gonna say that's probably my fault, but I really like to blame on Terry, I think. Of course. Yeah. Of course. You should have seen it when we went out to dinner when I was in California. We went out to dinner and uh we were doing a a, a live feed on Instagram yeah. and we must have been talking for about a good twenty minutes before we realized the camera wasn't on. I forgot that I <laughs> we had to go back and re-talk about everything. But I was much better the second take, though. <laughs> this is true, until you told me that I was having a Long Island iced tea instead of an iced tea. Those are good. Oh, you man. They'll, the <laughs> they'll, put you, they'll put you down. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't, it was, mine, was, mine was just a regular iced tea. He's, he's Those are, a Long Island iced tea is no joke. If you, you know that you're serious when you go and order that. Yeah. You can't do it. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little secret about that. Mm, yes. Living, growing up on Long Island, uh, being in the bar at like you know, it was like 17 or 18. It was the year that Long Island iced tea came out, and I, I think I, tur I was turning 18, and I was a drinking age back then, so you know, but we'd already been regulars in the bar for a year or so, and uh, friends were just buying me iced teas all night. I'm like, damn, these things <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> like, yeah, nothing, yeah, yeah, not a problem until I stood up or tried uh -huh. to stand up and just yeah. literally went right back down and uh. I guess someone drove me home that night. So that's the thing. That's the key is never stand up. You just have to stay on your bar stool keep, and then everything will be okay. I actually, I could have just been sitting in my car in the parking lot and it could have been serving me. They would have been good to go. I would have just driven home and it would have been good. Oh, yeah. We did like that. The Sonic, the Sonic. Did they roll up to you in roller skates? Yeah. That's it. Long Island ice teas are no joke. And when you go out, we used to go out, my buddy Harold and I, we would go out and they would serve buckets of Long Island iced teas to the like clubs that we would go to. I'm like, man, this is, <laughs> this is definitely going to get ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard, uh, what, what do you have going on out there? You're in uh, Northern California? Yeah, I live in Northern California between Sacramento and San Francisco. And as I'm sure most of the people watching would know that I do all my stuff with the guys down at West Tech Performance. Shout out to Steve Relay and Ish and Eric and Troy and Rick, the owner, for getting all that stuff done. Because I've been going out there. I, it's got to be coming up on 25 or 30 years now, I think. And, you know, it's just like everything. I, the first time I went there, I, after I showed up, I'm like, the first time I dined on something there, I'm like, Oh my God, I have so many questions. <laughs> and I decided right then that day that I was not going to let them get rid of me ever. <laughs> so, so I just <laughs> attached myself onto it. I, I've been there ever since. You know, um, since I started watching your videos, I didn't realize how much, how much is entailed in actual dyno and just a small, just a regular engine before you put any add-ons onto it. Oh yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that people don't realize, and I'm sure for what you're doing too, you know, people see a video and they go, oh yeah, I could easily do that. That takes no time at all. It takes no effort. It takes no preparation. Mm -hmm. And what they see, just like when they saw, cause all of this started when I was doing magazine stories basically. So, you know, you'd put together the motor and then you would test it and you'd write about, okay, this cylinder head did this or this camshaft did this. But they don't realize that all of the stuff up to that, to that two pages or three pages of the story and the 10 or 12 or 15 photos that it took, you know, just like an endless amount of work that you have to do before you get that information. So, you know, it's like anything. It's 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 a lot of work. But if you like it, like for me, I just live for the dyno results. So when I get those, I'm willing to do all the other stuff, go to the wrecking mm -hmm. yard and lay underneath and, you know, have transmission fluid drop in your ear and stuff. <laughs> all the stuff you got to do to make that happen. It's a lot of fun. Right, right. That's that's a wonderful thing, man. Uh, like I was telling you earlier, I love turbos. Uh, Terry's pushing oh, the yeah. the supercharger, the but, but man, yeah, there's, I, there's a supercharger. You know, I like the whistle, man. I and mean, you hear that turbo kick in? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the bus is gonna fit on the dyno, though. 
<laughs> yeah, I got a I got a school bus. I need you to tweak it for me. Tweak my turbo. <laughs> what what school bus? Is it a Bluebird? What is it? Yeah, Bluebird uh International. Oh cool. What it's year a, is it? Uh oh three. Nice. And so what motor's in it? Uh the DT four sixty six E. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So are you are you doing anything to it or just yeah, moving I'm, around? I'm uh turning into an RV. Me and okay, my wife nice. are gonna we're gonna retire and uh, travel. Oh, that's so perfect. We'll, we'll, we'll be out there messing around with you too. We'll come out That'd there. Be, and... I, I definitely want to ride in the bus then. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's what I told him. <laughs> oh yeah, in SEMA. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming through. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, well, and 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 if it's big enough, I'll just sleep on the bus too. I don't even have to get a hotel room or nothing. That'd be awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's gonna he's going to have a he's gonna have a, a kitchen in there, um, a bed, shower, <laughs> bath, yeah, shower. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, full blown house. That'd be great. We can work on the motor while you're driving. That'll be perfect. That's what I'm saying. We can do it. Yeah, we'll turn the boost up. That'll be all good. Yep, yep. Wow. I got a guy coming. I I got to get him to get the governor off. You know, he has the governor on it. So. Oh, yeah. If I can get to 75, I'll be good, I think. <laughs> you don't need to I, don't, I don't know if you want to be doing too many high-speed chases with the bus, <laughs> but, it, you know, certainly cool. Uh, you, you never know when you got to get into somebody. You know, they act up at the light. I might have to put the foot hey, in. Hey, you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> yep. you got to. See, I know Lewis. He's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna try to turn it up a little bit every now and then. Just give a little you tweak. Gotta, you got, you got to make it your own, right? I mean, yeah. You know. Oh, no, that's cool stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah anything? Ray, oh, go ahead. No, no. I was gonna say I was gonna, I was gonna ask Ray a question what? about what's it called? Um, I found the out. I found the answer out because you, uh, when we were talking about the, um, well, last video I did where it was with the brackets. For yeah. the Le Mans, I believe on the hideaway headlights on 68 9, they had a different bracket for the hideaway headlights itself. Whereas, whereas the non hideaway headlights and the Le Mans Tempest T 37, whatever it is, they shared the same bumper bracket. I would tend to believe, well, I would tend to believe that the Le Mans and Tempest with the chrome bumper so all share the same brackets. Yeah. Yeah. So did so did the Endura bumper with here, we'll move this up here. the hideaway yeah, headlights. headlights. Okay. Yeah. I would go with that too. Sure. Yeah. yeah sure. So, you know, like I did a little research on that and I found oh, out. Yeah, is that better? Okay. You oh, found I'm just talking, talking about the case. <laughs> T yeah. uh, T37 for the win. I really like those. When I got a quick T37 story for you, I was over, I went to visit Dulcich at his place and we were picking up a couple of motors that they were giving me because that's how I get all my best motors if somebody gives them to me. They cast them off and, and I think that they're gold. And so I went, I took my my two kids there to um, with me to, to get the engines and put them in the truck and take them back home. And they had a T37 there and it had a broken window and it had a like a it had a price tag on it that said like I don't know twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollars whatever. My youngest son's like, Daddy, you should totally buy that. That's cheap. You should get it. I'm like, yes, <laughs> I know I should. I don't I don't think that they would take that for it though. But he was all in. He wanted he wanted to see a muscle car come home. You know, oh, that's how it I, I have a T thirty seven story for you too. I yeah, think awesome. it was probably nineteen seventy four. I was in summer school on Long Island, and. I was taking driver's ed, but I was taking a, a, another class too. And outside the window of the school, it was a different school. It wasn't the one I was in high school. It was, a, it was a, the middle school. I guess one of the janitors or something had a brand, well, it was probably like a year old or two years old, T37 parked outside. And I didn't know what it was, but I'm like looking at the stripes. I'm looking at the rally twos. I'm like, yeah, that's just like a cool looking car. Yeah, you know, not a GTO, but it, it's what what is that? You know, it's like seeing a heavy Chevy and you're like, what yeah. the hell is going on? So uh it, it always stuck with me. It's, it's GTO esque. It is you know to, yeah. to beat the insurance companies. Yeah, you know, it has yeah. potential. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. And and it's cool enough that that you know, like the right kind of guys that see it are gonna know what it is, but a lot of people are not. So it's yeah. you know, it's that kind of car, and I and I really like those. Well, yeah, it's like, you know, like like the heavy Chevy. I mean, it's it's hiding in yep. plain sight. You can't mistake it for any other kind of car. I mean, it yep. is, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I love it when they played around with models like that and just came out with, uh, you know, like the Rally 350 Olds, you know, another one. Mm -hmm. yep. was, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. An insurance company beater, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I like I, I like that they played those games. Yeah, but I yeah. tell you, like I, I always thought back in that era that Pontiac, like 
all across the board, Bonneville, Granville, whatever, back back then, it, with the exception of the Grand Prix, they all had like a sad look to them in the front. It looked like they, <laughs> it looked like they were crying a little bit. Like they were just very sad looking cars. Because no one's paying attention to them. That's why. That's They're why. <laughs> I can see we could come up with that. Yeah, I can see we could we could see that. Yeah. But, but the, Pontiac, the, 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 the Pontiac side had all of the cool stuff though. They had better aerodynamics. They had better handling. They had they had all kinds of cool stuff. I remember hearing a really great story about the Pontiac stuff. And they were they took the cars, they this is when they were running NASCAR, and they took the cars out and they ran them on the track. And the Pontiac went faster than the Chevrolet did. And then they put the then they swapped the motors and they put the Chevy motor in the Pontiac, the Pontiac motor in the Chevrolet. And then the Pontiac still went faster. And they're like, what's why is that why is it doing that? And they found two things. One was the aerodynamics of the Pontiac at the time. And I can't remember which model it was because this was pretty mm -hmm. early on. But the the aerodynamics of the Pontiac was better. And the other thing that it had is the Pontiac had a, a cold air intake ducted to the carburetor. So they were actually taking cowl induction, yeah. basically, kind of like they eventually did on the 69 Z28s and on, and on the um, on the LS6 Chevelle and those. But the Pontiac had was drawing cold air, so its motor, whichever one it had in there, because they knew that the Chevrolet had a little bit more power than the Pontiac of the two cars that they were testing. But the cold air made the difference, and then the aerodynamics of the Pontiac were a little bit better too. So you I, know, I, I love these kind of stories. How do you say that? Yeah. One of the things I do is I read a lot of old magazines. I got them all over the place. I was just reading one yeah. upstairs in in the bathroom, and it was out of the. Um, they had like a hundred and one tips. It was a hot rod magazine from I think the the eighties or nineties, and one of them was about cold air induction, and and they mentioned how you know Pontiac really only had the well the ram air engines, but you had the um, you know, the, the Trans Am scoops were fake. The GTO yeah. had a fresh air intake. And they said it really, you know, anything that's in that plane of the hood, it's in the wrong barrier. It's in the wrong spot, yeah. Yeah, it's in the wrong spot. So the, the really the only car that, that they recommend, which I agree with, that had the right aerodynamics at the time was the Oldsmobile that picked it up from under the bumper. Yeah, you know, the yeah, because yeah, yeah, the yeah, they had the yeah. duct mm -hmm. going under, right? Yeah. Under the bumpers, right. So at least you're picking yeah. it up that in that lower barrier. Uh, so yeah, I don't know what what uh what what intake they would they would deal with there, but well, they were they were drawing hood, they were drawing air from the cowl basically. So they're routing the ducting back to okay. the um to to the cowl area, which is the pressurized source when you're going at speed where the window is, when the windshield is, and that's how your basically how your vents and all of that stuff work. Right. So they were getting basically essentially some pressurized air. They they weren't talking about that too much, but. They were getting a, a, a source of cold air, and, and if you get cold air, it makes more power. Now, I was going to say, if it was in NASCAR, they would reverse the air cleaner. And Chevy had the parts in the book with that. And I was going to do that with a couple of my cars. You know, yeah. cut right into the into the firewall for the cowl, but you kind of need that long, wide uh, accordion. Because yeah, like, like, be like the Z28s were like that. Yeah, the 80, yep. Yeah. It's got to be. Even, even the Chevelle, that's why I went with a flap hood, even though there's an LS exactly. in this thing, and it, and it doesn't. It doesn't. It's more for show, but right. you, you got to have the flap hood, though. I mean, yeah, you, know, you got to thank you. Got to have the flap. Yeah, and uh, but the real flap, what people don't understand, if you unless you have one, there were two doors. There were one two on doors. The, one above and one below. Right, right. One on yeah. the one on the hood and one below that yeah. was uh, act that was actuated like the eighty Z twenty eight, where the the one on the hood was vacuum. Yep. Mm -hmm. The one in the back that's electrical. Okay. And what's it called? So with the Z28, you had this little little thing that stuck out, and you had a, a rod off of the off the gas pedal. So when you got like maybe three quarters of the way in, yeah, it would it. open up like so an nitrous activation switch, like a full throttle switch, right? Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So that you know what? Other one was cool is the Dodge or Plymouth had the air grabber that used to open up on the hood too, <laughs> and they had a, like a little. The little drawing or something on the side of it that had a cool little face or something on it, right? It was shark tooth. That was, yeah. like was, like, <laughs> that was on the like super big. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You know, Matt, Go Matt Gobert was just Matt Go was just saying he thinks that what you I think I think he's talking about what you're talking about was between the Chevy and the Pontiac was when they had the Aero Coupe. That was in the '80s. They had that Monty SS. Yeah, yeah, they, they had the Monte Carlo, yeah. Oh, the oh my God, that was a hideous-looking car. Those the things were worth so much money. It was horrible. You know, you know I, I got guys running around around my town here that's got those big wheels on them. They're just messing them up, man. I'm like, dude, you know how much that car is worth? 
Right. The back, the back glass by itself. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. That's got to be big money now. Oh, um, yeah. that was the, that was I tell problem. you what, the Grand Prix four, four plus four, two plus two. That's what it was. It was the Grand Prix two plus two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a better looking car. I'm sorry, yeah, but you don't see very many of them though. You don't. No, you don't see classier any too inside. Yeah. More luxury. Well, yeah. see, that's what it was. The, the the Pontiac. That that's the excitement, man. <laughs> that's the excitement. Hey, John DeLorean did a good job when he was when he was at Pontiac. Yeah, he was he was the man, DeLorean. He did the good first, stuff. He was the man, DeLorean. Yeah. Brian, uh, did, Brian did just confirm that it was the Aero Coupe and the uh, and the two plus two that and the two, two plus, plus two, two was the car that ran faster. Okay, and I remember I remember a buddy having a. Jesus, I'm going to say it was a 73 or 74. I forgot what it was. No, 74 Grand Prix. The, that was like the second year when they went long. Yeah. And, uh, that, that was the prettiest car, man. It was burgundy. It had a white Landau roof with a white gut sunroof. And it had the it had the uh, the lights in the with the cross in it. The, yeah, I mean, like, it was, like my like my 70 Camaro had the one in the front. Yeah, the the those are oh, cool. Let's not talk about 70 Camaros, please. <laughs> Four spot on the show. That was my first car. <laughs> mine was 75. Nice. You know, mine second was, gen- mine was a, my first one was a split bumper, but it was a base. It was a rally sport, but it was a base car, so it had a two barrel motor in it. That's yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Mine was an 88. Nice. <laughs> I I still have my um. I have a 1988 five liter Mustang that I bought new in November of 87. Yeah. So I'm, I'm original owner five liter. still. I still have the car. That was a pretty fast car that year. It was, it was the first year of the mass air for California only in 88. And it was a stick and I, and I bought it with, I deleted almost everything. I didn't delete AC cause I needed that, but I bought it so I could go showroom stock racing in SCCA. Right. <laughs> Shortly after that, they brought out the one LE Camaro, which unfortunately was much, <laughs> a much better car because I would go through brakes. I would go through uh, rotors and pads, sometimes calipers every race. Uh, we would just destroy them. And the one LE Camaros would just would outbreak us without any problem at all. They were they were better cars, but I love the Mustang. It worked out good and I still have it. Hey, Rich, are you in the 200 Club? Yes, I, I went um, 227 in my Honda Civic, which... To this day, as far as I know, is still the world's fastest Honda Civic. Wow, that had to be <laughs> scary. <laughs> uh, the Civic actually it, is a a front wheel drive car at Bonneville is definitely the way to go as opposed to rear wheel drive car because it's such a loose surface that putting power down is very difficult. So if you have a rear wheel drive car, the back end kind of wants to pass the front end and get a little crazy. But on a front wheel drive car, the weights over the drive wheel. We even had an open diff. I did. I didn't have. We didn't have um, a limited slip or a quay or anything. It was just a, a stock open diff, and the thing would just track like perfectly straight. And until we broke a um, we broke a half shaft at wow. the four mile mark, and then things got exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to have a car that pulls than to push. Yeah, it worked out a lot better. The back end's just like along for the ride. It's just like, hey, we're just doing our thing back here. Out, going on. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Oh, I do like those. <laughs> Michelle Mouton. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. And all those little groupy cars, uh, 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 Mazda 323 GTX. Those are awesome. The Lancia Deltas, the, the little MG Metros that I got to ride in an RS 200 up at a Virginia City Hill Climb. that was all modified. I those. I just love those cars. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So what is yeah. your uh, what is your your main car now? Like, I know you said you had a Mustang, but you have anything else? Like, the the one that I drive every day that, and I get questions about this all the time because I do a lot of LS testing. Obviously, is is I have a um, 2002 Chevy Silverado with a 5.3 in it that's all stock that now has 300,000 miles in it. And everyone's like, well, did you put a turbo on it? Did you do all this? I'm like, that. Yeah, it has a 4060E transmission. It's made of glass. I mean, <laughs> I don't even want to put a cam in it because I know that it will just, it will, I hardly ever even go full throttle in that truck because I know that I'm just waiting for inevitably, inevitably something is going to break on it. But so, so yeah, the when other that day happens, it, When that day happens, what are you going to do? Uh, I think buy a new truck. <laughs> I need, I have to have one car. Like my wife has a new Mercedes. And so we drive that everywhere, but I have to have one car that I can use that I can, that stays stock, that I can go pick everything up in. 
Mm. The other cars I have, like the Mustang doesn't have an engine in it right now. It's been sitting for a really long time. I just bought the Dodge Omni GLH Turbo that has a modified 2.5 big turbo intercooler, all that stuff on it. So the motor's hurt right now because I bought it that way. So that's a little bit of a project. Um, I also have a 71 240Z. Again, there's no motor in it. I bought it because I took the motor out of it because we were going to do a V8 swap. And I still want to do that. Although I do have an RB25 <laughs> sitting there that I also am going to do testing on. It would be perfect in that car. It would just look awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else do I have? Uh, I have a, a 1996 F355 Spider Ferrari. <laughs> Oh, wow. that oh, nice. just sits under a cover its whole life and i'm now probably gonna sell it and the only reason i have it is because i got such a good de good deal on it it was like one of the least expensive cars i've ever bought so oh, wow. it was such a good deal that i just and i've always wanted a ferrari and i drove it around took my kids to school in it and stuff and then now it just kind of sits and i want to get something i i'd actually much rather now get um <laughs> some kind of driver muscle car, a, a, a 1970 Chevelle or a Camaro or, or even a, a, an old challenger like a, and make it look like a TA six pack or that kind of deal. Something that we can drive and I could go out to date night with my wife in because in that car, I can't afford to fix it. So if I drive it and somebody bangs yeah. into it or gets a paint scratch or whatever, I, I you know, I, I'm not a Ferrari guy, so I can't, I can't yeah. even fix it. Well, I got parts of a challenger if you want to start building one. I I, what, I really really like the um first of all I, I admire Dan Gurney who was was in in every way like seventy five different kinds of awesome I have a good story about Dan Gurney I, I I don't think that I've ever met him but um one of the guys from Osco Performance Dennis Ozzy was telling a story about when the people were over when Dan was alive and he was over at All American Racers that when he would walk into the shop. And he would stop and talk to somebody and he'd start telling a story that everybody there just dropped the wrenches and stopped what they were doing and then went over to listen to the stories that he was telling. Because, I mean, look what the guy's done. And, and, and if you read ever read anything about him, that everything that everybody says is the guy was like, you know, just the, the greatest kind of stand up guy, he was an awesome driver. He was great to be around. He was just, you know, he was the right kind of person. So, uh, but but one of my favorite cars is that um, the AA Arcuda. So, if the with the six pack on it and the TA six pack, the same same kind of thing, just a, just a a Dodge and a Chrysler version of it. But I'm I much really rather have like an AAR than a Hemi. Much rather have an AAR than a Hemi. Oh, oh, me too. I'm not I'm not a big Hemi fan. I know what they're worth and all that, but but a 346 pack car would be much higher on my list. Than and a, it's a better Hemi looking car too. Yeah, I, I do. I, I really like it. Yeah, did you ever see that? Did you see that show Uppity? They've talked about uh, Dan Gurney. There's I, a show I on, on Netflix about um, Willie Riggs, Ribs. Oh, Willie T. Ribs. Yeah, I I Ribs. raced with Willie, not with him, but when I was running World Challenge, it was the same time that he was driving in Trans Am. So uh, World Challenge was a support series for Trans Am. So he was at the races and the, at the drivers wow. meetings and stuff when we were there. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, he, he was, a, he was a good driver. Oh no, he was so the, the story so sad. I mean, he just didn't get the opportunity. But yeah, you know. But um, no, he yeah. was a good. He was yeah, and he loved Dan Gurney, and he they talk about Dan Gurney a lot. And it yeah. got to the, it's, it's really cool because when he was a kid, he took a picture with Dan Gurney. Right, come yeah. to find out that he 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 raced for Dan Gurney later on in life. Yeah, see, that's just oh, awesome. that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. That was kind of the neat thing about being there. Like I. I remember going to the Long Beach Grand Prix, which we went to a lot. And this is back when Little Al was driving and this was kind of like his track. And I remember going there thinking, OK, next year I'm going to I'm going to race in this. Not in an Indy car, <laughs> but no, I'm going to race in this. So yeah. I was running for uh, with the guys from Bear Racing and World Challenge. And I ended up buying that car and we put a supercharger on it. And I ran in the Bridgestone Supercar Series, which was a support series for the IndyCar guys that weekend. So I actually got to run at the Long Beach Grand Prix. So the cool thing about it was we were outmatched by the other cars that were there and, and, and more than likely the drivers as well. But you do get to sit in driver's meetings with like when, when I was racing, Paul Newman was driving one of the Lotuses. Nice. So you get to sit in driver's meetings with guys like Paul Newman, who I 
you know, I, I'm not a big, um, I don't get uh, googly eyed over starstruck. Star and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't get starstruck over that. But he was one of the guys that just for me was just like super awesome. Um, but also like Mario and Dreddy and all those guys were there at the driver's meeting. So you're like, yeah, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is so awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mario is a very nice guy. Very nice guy. I like Mario. Yeah, I've I've met him at SEMA, but I you know I didn't get to mm -hmm. talk to him that much. But he, yeah, he's and and he did everything. He was one of the guys that back in the day, like Parnelli Jones and all these guys that just drove everything. They don't they didn't care. He wasn't just an IndyCar driver. He wasn't. Yeah. I mean, he was an IndyCar champion, a Formula One champion. So he did that. But he also drove everything. He drove USAC and midgets and just you know Can Am and everything, everything back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's a real, real deal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. De yeah, definitely. I, I talked I talk to, uh, what's it called, um, Mr. Andretti. I call him Mr. Andretti because, like, anyone at that level. He like, is Mr. Andretti, Richard, Andretti, definitely, yeah. Muhammad Ali, Mr. Richard yeah. Petty. Oh, yeah. Mr. Magic Johnson. Uh, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and I talked to him, and I told him, I was like, flat out. Um, I was like, he, I asked him, what was your favorite car? He goes, any car I can win it. And he asked me <laughs> off the camera, yeah. what do you know any of my cars? I was like, I would have to say my favorite car that you ever drove was that 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 player special. Oh yeah, the yeah, the, the John Black. Deal, yeah. I was yep. like that that I I even still have the G plus the AFX G plus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I still have the AFX G plus. I love it. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's good stuff. Yeah, and then I went over to Richard Petty, <laughs> another guy who could drive. Man, you know those guys were were real drivers because they didn't have the technology no you know what i mean no. yeah they yeah they they had something special about them that not to take away anything from lewis hamilton or any of these guys obviously mm -hmm. but that what they were doing a lot of times was adapting to stuff that was thrown at them and then you know because the car was <laughs> less than 100 percent, let's say and they would work around it which was an amazing thing yeah. mm. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I, I remember seeing, I guess it was a couple of years ago, I forgot who the driver was, but it was a new NASCAR driver. And they put him, they pulled out a one of uh one of those old NASCAR, like like uh, a Dodge Charger, like how Richard Petty, the fifth the 43. Yeah, and they allowed him to drive it around the track, and he was just like, I couldn't do it. He goes, mm -hmm. he goes, once this car got to about 110, that was it for me. You know, he, yeah. barely, he tapped out. You know, this is a professional the, drop. He's going 180. Really, and, and imagine, like, in some of those cars, like the Super Bs and stuff, they were going 200 in those cars. So yeah. it, was, it was pretty fast. Yeah. yeah. It would, yeah. With no power steering. And, no. you know, I mean, they were working. Yeah. yeah. You know, Their power steering was big wheel. steering wheels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can imagine how loose that steering wheel must have been. Oh, you know? yeah. I mean, you know, guys like Mark Martin and Dale Earnhardt, even, even later than, than, than Petty and stuff, those guys were like, those guys are like real guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah rack in elect electrical tape. Yeah. yeah, I've been like seeing earlier NASCARs when these guys are on the beach. Oh, in the fifties, in yeah. convertible, in Tony, yeah. in Bel Air, and they're wearing t-shirts with open helmets and smoking a cigarette as they drive. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> out the window. Marlboros. Yeah. Well, you you gotta you gotta look good while you're doing it, right? You can't just do it. You gotta... Yeah. Yeah, no, no helmet whatsoever. Oh, yeah, no, they had a helmet. It was like a skull cap. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a lot of them early on were just leather, football helmets. Yeah, the yeah. Leather football helmets. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't do that, man. Even in a convertible now, there's no way. I, 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 mm -mm. <laughs> I don't even like when somebody else is driving, even when it has a top on it. <laughs> yeah, me either. I'm not a Never. convertible man. And that's yeah. from that comes from like I did a lot of. Um, uh, instruction. I did a lot of driving instruction and, and it, it came from that. Like when I was out on the track and I could drive from the passenger, which, which confused a lot of people. So I, I could drive on the track from the passenger side. And a lot of guys can do that. It's not that big a deal. I would tell them, okay, look here, start feeling it. You need to start turning in. Okay. Here's your apex. Okay. Now you can feel it. We want to start exiting out. We want to start exiting out. And we're doing that. And, I, and I'm telling them, Hey, look, you can do this. this. This is not, it's not magic. It's not that hard. I said, just Look at see the see that rock right there. When you when we when you can't see that rock anymore, that's when you need to turn in, and then you need to go to right there and be looking at the big picture. And you tell them all of that stuff. But when I'm in the passenger seat, just driving around town, I'm it's just you know I'm I'm frightened beyond all belief. <laughs> you're out of, because you're I, out of I do control. not like that's it. Why. You're out of control. You're yeah, I control. just I don't like it at all. Mm. 
<laughs> yep. That's all good, though. Yeah. You know? So did you guys see the um, a couple of the cool uh, videos that I just posted recently, a couple of the cool tests that I did? Guys have been wanting me to do um, compound boost for a long time. So I did, I did way back, I did uh, – compound turbo so one turbo feeding another turbo on an ls and i thought that was really cool and i just did it as a g whiz thing because i'd never done it before uh, I, i'd never done you know what i take that back i had done it before <laughs> in my in my chevy sprint we we set some land speed records with this turbo sprint so it made uh, it was making like 110 at the tire and we went 119 miles an hour in the standing mile and then we set two records and we were getting ready to set our third record and then the clutch let go so it started slipping so we couldn't set our third record but we then we were going to go to bonneville and we brought the car home we're putting a cage in and then somebody stole the car unfortunately oh, I still have the motor wow. code, but somebody stole the car so i'm so disappointed because i love that car but i but before they stole it i did do some testing on a compound setup because the sprint turbo has a little little tiny turbo as you would imagine i mean it was rated at 70 horsepower with the turbo so it didn't make a ton yeah. of power so i took a volkswagen turbo and then compounded those two on the chassis dyno to make that work. But then I did one on the I did one on the LS again, just more of a G whiz thing. Not that you need to do that or that I would even recommend it on that application. It was just kind of cool to have two junkyard, you know, this junkyard motor with two cheap turbos blowing into each other and make lots of boost, make lots of power. And recently, what I did was we took a junkyard 3800 series two. V6, the supercharged motor that's in the Pontiac Grand Prix or the Buick Regal GS, those kinds of things. And so it had a supercharger on it. And then we added a turbo to that. So we have the turbo blowing into the supercharger with yeah. an intercooler in between the two hmm. running on E85. And again, it, it's probably not what I would recommend a guy do, but we don't always do what they should do. We do what they want us to do. And and, yeah. and those were really kind of cool tests yeah. and people like that because it's, you know, it's boost on boost and there's nothing a motor needs more than boost. Even if it already has some boost, it obviously needs more boost, right? Yeah. 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 That's it. That's the thing you wouldn't necessarily do to your own car at home, yeah. you know, but yeah. you want to see somebody else do it first. And the nice thing on the, yeah. on the dyno, it's easy to do too. So we don't have to ruin a car to do it. And, you know, it takes a lot less time just to build it on the dyno and everything fits. Right, right. Now, now, when you when you when you're at West Tech and you're doing all those dyno pulls, um, what what is it? You guys got, got like a bunch of engines that you just have laying around. I mean, because I have, them. I probably have at any one time. I think that the most I've ever had is 21 or 22 different engines. Wow, and that sounds like a lot. Except that if you go buy them for a couple hundred dollars from the wrecking yard, it, you know, it's not a fortune. And so, and the nice thing is it is those engines if we blow one up which has happened many times you don't you don't care about it like if i put together a brand new motor and it has four rods and forged pistons and the best heads and all of that stuff on it and then i put it on there i almost don't want to run it because that's the motor that i'm worried about is going to get hurt yeah, <laughs> if yeah. i go get a motor from the wrecking yard and and the only cost so far has been that we put oil on it <laughs> put oil in it like new oil um and it blows up you're like yeah, that's bad. Uh, but it's only two hundred dollars bad or three hundred dollars bad. <laughs> right. It's not, it it's not right. ten thousand dollars bad, you know. Yeah. So I, that's why I like junkyard motors so well. And the other reason I like them is because they've already run. If you put them on there and they're not hurt, and you know, like we we try to look for crash cars, so you know that the thing was probably running when mm -hmm. they got in a wreck, and so the motor's probably good. So we put the motor up there and run it. And then when, when it's running, we know, okay, look, that now we can add boost to it. We can add nitrous. We can do whatever we want and hopefully do it correctly and not hurt it. But again, if we do, eh, you know, we're not out that much. No. Right, right. Yeah, so we got a guy here, a serious vet. He was like, Terry, Richard needs to test an LSA blower. I, I do, him. definitely. Yeah, I'm going to tell him. We had planned, me and Richard were <laughs> yeah. planning to go to West Tech. I guess it was uh, – SEMA last year, being that SEMA didn't happen. Yeah, I was gonna come out there like a week early or either stay a week late. And we were gonna, I was gonna send them one of my LSAs, full blown everything. And we were gonna, we we're gonna spend a couple of days out there just testing every single case scenario from, you know, I guess a cam. I guess we could have swapped out that a couple of, oh, them. yeah, a couple more yeah. than one. Yeah, more than one, uh, to cold air, to pulleys. We were gonna oh. go nuts. 
Yeah. We are going to go nuts, and we're still planning on doing that. I, I, I would love it because I get I get questions all the time. We run lots of supercharged stuff, like especially I did not too long ago. I did the, the inexpensive um, like eBay Cadillac turbo or supercharger and intercooler that people were selling with adapters. That was cool. That yeah, was we cool. did we did that, but everybody as soon as they saw that, they're like, Oh yeah, that's really cool. But we we need you to do an LSA because an LSA is readily available and, and it doesn't take adapters and you know you can make all that work. So they want to see that and, and I'm curious to see how much power it will support. So so we so leave a comment, everyone. <laughs> yes. We're definitely gonna do that. I got the power, I got the I got the tools. We got the knowledge. We got right. Richard. We just gotta we just gotta send all the stuff out to Richard. Exactly. <laughs> we're gonna do how, how many different isolators? We're gonna go 245, we're gonna go 255, uh, we're gonna do 235 isolators to see what you know. I'm sorry, oh, okay. pulleys yeah. to yeah. see which one if it makes a difference, the difference between a 245, 255. We can we can run ice water, we can do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Ice water, E85, all that's good. Yep. Yeah. And we just heard back from uh, what's called. I want to say what's up to my man Brian. Brian, <laughs> Brian, Brian I've known right. Brian, Brian since way back in the Wisco days and stuff. Uh, Brian, he's you know he's 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 the golden child. He's just a sweet sweet guy. And I, he's I, a I've run the Pro LS LS cam. Cam. I, I like him, Brian. Everyone that I've tested and I've done the videos on, they've always worked pretty well. Yeah. Well, we're gonna do that. We're gonna do we're gonna do air intakes. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna it's gonna yeah. be full. It's gonna be yep. full. You know. And I'm gonna be happy to be out there with my man. So um, Jim Jim has a question on compound boost. He wants to know if it's worth anything. And the thing that I will say about compound boost and and as an absolute thing, the comp, the supercharger is kind of in the way. So if you want to make lots and lots of power and you have a turbo or turbos that can support that power level, that's the way to go. And that's what that's what really big power is going to be like. But on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a big turbo and you're wanting to improve the spool rate of that turbo. The NA motor is not going to do that as well as a supercharged motor will. So let's say you have a 300 horsepower NA motor and then you add a blower to it. And now it's a 450 horsepower supercharged motor. The response rate of the turbo is going to go up dramatically now that you have the supercharger on. So it can help you, which is what Lancia did with their Delta rally cars and other people have done. So it's not it's not like the ultimate form of boost, but it does have its place and it works very well. And plus, like I said, the the reason that we do everything else in the world is because it's cool. Mm -hmm. Good. Wow. And, to, and to say that she did it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So when somebody says, hey, Richard, have you ever tested? Before they even finish their sentence, I can say yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So Richard, uh, I, I noticed um, this was a while back videos when you were uh, testing the eBay turbos. What, what is your opinion on those? <laughs> I, I can tell you that all of the eBay turbos that I've ever tested, like I have a GT45 that I got from the guys at DNA, which is one of the sources from eBay. And I've had it for, I, I don't know, it's got to be like eight or 10 years now. And we've I've run it on, I'm sure, 10 different engines and we've, we run it, run it, run it, run it, run it. And then I, when I'm done with it, I just take it and throw it on the ground. And then we go pick it up the next time. And, and, you know, so it's not like it's put in a, in a velvet case and put up on the shelf and it's yeah. just really just kicked around and it's worked perfect. And Workhorse. the same thing with the, the CX racing turbos. If you look at way back in 2010, when I did the first big bang motor with the guys from hot for the guys from hot rod, those 76 millimeter turbos are still alive. And so that's that was in 2010 or, or right in right in the 2010 to 2011 changeover. Mm -hmm. um, so all of the ones that I've had have always worked. And I and I've only ever had one turbo go bad on the dyno. And it went out as soon as we started the motor up. Wow. So the, so something was wrong with the machining mm -hmm. or whatever was going on with the turbo. It immediately locked itself up. And before I start any of those turbos, and I think that this probably helps with the longevity longevity of these things is that I always take and I squirt, we have a squeezy bottle. Oh, so I squirt oil in the turbo and spin the shaft and spin it and spin it and spin it until oil is coming out. And then we hook up the oiling system because if you start up the motor and it has exhaust flow before it gets oil flow, you'll get a lot of like um, bearing and impeller speed and you'll have no oiling in there. So I like to give it a chance and kind of break it in before that 
because you know, you have no idea how long that turbo has been sitting because it's if it got shipped over from China, how long it was there, how long it was in the boat, how long it was in the the receiving warehouse and all that. So you, you just don't have and any idea. So like to give it down a, if it was right side up or yeah, yeah, you know, and and with stuff stacked against it, so it's pushing on the thrust bearing. You know, you just don't know any of that stuff. So I like to try to give it a good chance, a good fighting chance, and I've had nothing but good luck with them. That's you know what I bet you that's probably the reason why you had good luck because you like pre pre lube it, you know. You know we're not going to be nice to it, so at least we're nice to it at the beginning. We'll buy it a drink first, and then yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, you know, and everything. You know? No, of course. Yeah. <laughs> now, so um, what are those? What are those price ranges on those? Well, that that GT forty five turbo that we use basically on everything. I've run that on everything from the little Honda all the way up to a big block Chevy. And that's about a 700 to 750 horsepower turbo because that's kind of how I rate them is we we choose the turbo based on whatever power output we want. Mm -hmm. So that turbo is about 700 or 750, depending on what motor it's on. And that one cost one hundred and sixty three dollars. Wow. That's crazy. Well, it really I mean, people don't realize it really is a good time to be a performance guy. Um, because I can remember trying to or thinking about trying to do turbo stuff like to my five liter Mustang and there were car tech kits and, but all that stuff was like three, four, five grand. And yeah. you know, back in the eighties, that was, that was half as much as I paid for my car. So it's just, it was yeah. not something that was ever going to happen for me. Uh, well, let me ask you this, Rich. So if that, you said that turbo will cost about, like you said, like under 200 bucks, right? Yeah. Now to have the entire setup, what are we looking at as far as let's say you want to, you know, like have that turbo on, I don't know, like let's say a regular, this uh, small block or something like that. I mean, with the plumbing, well, the, the, what do you think a person would be into? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Let's go oh, with a, a Cadillac uh, 425. There you uh, go. <laughs> well, I have a Cadillac 500, so I'm very familiar with those motors. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a 500 that, that I did a bunch of stuff with the guy, with Courtney and the guys from the um, CADCO out there. So we did a bunch of stuff together. Um, you can easily run a turbo with any sort of exhaust system. So if you take your stock exhaust manifolds from whatever engine, from your Cadillac, we use the LS stuff, from a small block Chevy, from a Dodge, whatever it is, you route that exhaust to some sort of Y section that comes together to mount the turbo. And, and where that is, is going to depend on what chassis you're putting it in. So wherever that will fit, mm -hmm. you, you route that together. If you can weld, that's going to be inexpensive. If you have to have somebody else do it, it's going to be more expensive you're probably going to spend more money on the aluminum tubing and clamps and things that you need than you will on the major components. So you have the turbo, which is anywhere from 150 to $250, let's say. And then you have some kind of intercooler. Intercoolers like the turbo are very cheap. They can be as little as a couple of hundred dollars. But then you have lots of aluminum tubing to connect the turbo to the intercooler and then the intercooler into the throttle body or carburetor or whatever it is you're doing. Um, for guys building turbo kits, obviously they have other things that they're going to need. They're going to need, if it's a fuel injected car, they're going to need bigger injectors. So you have to go with decapped injectors, very common, or an 80 pounder, this the DECA 80 pounder is fairly, is fairly common and fairly inexpensive. Some sort of big fuel pump is going to be necessary. Um, my guess is I'll bet, and, and I, and I was going to do a video on this. I was going to do a thousand or a thousand horsepower for a thousand dollars. The turbo mm -hmm. kit that you could put on, and we would pick an LS because it's the easiest one. But you, I think you could make a thousand horsepower for a thousand dollars. You'd have to do some of the work yourself. You'd have to do some of the welding yourself. But the parts are not that expensive. You know, even if you had to, pay, even you have to farm out the welding, you're talking about like maybe like twelve hundred, thirteen hundred. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, for like less than two thousand dollars, easily with all of that done. Well, mm -hmm. here's another question now. You said you'd do an LS. Which particular LS would you go with? Because there's multitudes. It, it doesn't matter because the nice thing about the turbo kit is it would work with any LS because the exhaust manifolds bolt on the same way. So right. it would work on a 4.8, a 5.3, a 6.0, 6.2, whatever combination that you want. The one that I would get for me is the one that I see most prevalent at the yard. And I go to the yards all the time and, and we'll see 10 or 12 LS motors there. Um, you're going to see, or what we see is a four, eight or a five, three. Those yeah. are the most common. I very, very, I, I think I've seen one 
six liter there. I've never seen any aluminum motors. No. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, recently I saw a my very first front wheel drive LS4, and it actually had um, it had 243 heads on it. So it's a, again, Ooh. also the first time I've ever seen 243 heads in a yard. All the other ones are 706 and 862. Yeah, yep. But the nice thing is a 5.3 with a cam and springs and a turbo, you can make a thousand horsepower with that. Mm. And that's a that's a ridiculous amount of power. <laughs> now, now here's another question, real quick. Um, which heads do you prefer, the square port or either the cathedral? Which well, again, I'm going to the wrecking yard and getting a four eight or a five three. I'm going to put cathedral port heads on it because the wreck port's not going to fit. So mm. I only have the option to use a wreck port head if it's a six liter or a six point two. Right. Uh, in in that case, then I would if I'm going to the lowest cost way to do that would be to do a factory rec port head because it's a it flows more than any of the cathedral port heads do and it will make more power wow. but if i'm doing aftermarket heads i probably would pick a cathedral port head interesting interesting Trick, tricks of the trade i guess yeah man <laughs> and and again the the thing that n not necessarily because i like one head more than the other but i one of the things i always talk about on my shows is that if we select a turbo for a given power level so let's say we have a thousand horsepower turbo we have an s475 an s480 a 7875 gen 2 from vs racing we have our quintessential thousand horsepower turbo you don't need a lot of other stuff in the motor to have it make that thousand horsepower. It's gonna do that. If you have a turbo and an intercooler, big injectors, E85, any sort of CAN 5.3. If I had seven different cams up on the shelves, I could close my eyes, pick one of those things, never even look at it, put it in the 5.3, put springs on it, put that boost on it, and I could get it to make a thousand horsepower. Mm. It doesn't have to be a turbo cam. It doesn't, it could be a nitrous cam, an NA cam, a blower mm. cam, it doesn't matter. The turbo is going to do that. It's just going to take more or less boost to get it there. And that's one of the things that I've been trying to tell people is that every cam is a turbo cam. So, and, and not that there aren't better cams to help make that power. But what I'm saying is that if a guy has a motor and he has a cam in it, just add the turbo, man, and good things are going to happen. Yeah, so you're saying the turbo really is the determinant. It's not the the ancillary yeah. components around it. That's it's it's like the restrictor plate on a restrictor plate NASCAR motor. It's going to determine what the power output is. If you only have a 700 horsepower turbo, you're not going to make a thousand horsepower. Right. You can make 700. Now, what kind of injectors would you recommend? Like, let's say someone wants to do like a 700 horsepower, and they don't really care about that thousand. Yeah. But is is like a 55 pound 60 pound injector okay or uh the one that we, the, the go to the go to one is an 80 pound injector and a good way to do that um to do that math is if you take the injector size like we have an 80 pound injector and you multiply that by 16 that will tell you how much power those injectors will support on a v8 that's mm. naturally aspirated naturally aspirated they, right that's naturally aspirated because we're looking at, and that's that's assuming that it's a 0.5 brake specific fuel consumption number, yep. which an LS actually does a lot better than that. I mean, we've seen them in the 4.3, 4.4 range, so it will actually make more than that. But then if you multiply that number by, well, we like to be conservative, so we say 0.75, that will kind of tell you what's going to happen under boost and how much power it will support. Now, what gives you those numbers? What are those numbers? I mean, 16 and 0.75. Well, 16 is basically, it takes a half a pound of fuel per hour to make one horsepower. Okay. So one pound will make two horsepower. So whatever the flow rate of the injector is, if you just double it, and then in this case, we're multiplying, we're doubling that and then multiplying it by eight, which is the number of cylinders. You can also multiply it by six or four if you have a six cylinder or a four cylinder and get similar numbers. It's just really easy math. And you can do that in your head and go, okay, look, a hundred a, a hundred pound an hour injector can support 200 horsepower per cylinder. So I, whatever number of cylinders you have, you're like, okay, well, I can make this much power. And then, then we know that, oh yeah, we're, we have way more injector than we're ever going to use. So we know that that's enough. If okay. we have a 25 pound injector, it's only going to support 50 horsepower per hole. And that's only 400 horsepower on a, on a V8. So that's not very much. 
Hmm. Okay. Now, now that that works, I would imagine that works also on superchargers and everything, right? It it, it works the same. The, the one thing about that guys don't realize about the supercharger is that the it doesn't work directly for the power output because a supercharger also costs power. So it takes, for instance, I've seen lots of um, blower dyno testing. The guys at Kenny Bell have a blower dyno. They have a 500 horsepower blower dyno. So they can run the supercharger at speed and they can measure the amount of airflow that goes through the blower at any given blower speed and boost level and output. And you can have like, uh, for instance, on some of these roots blowers, you can have uh, 250 or 300 horsepower worth of parasitic loss on the Ooh. blower when it's spun all the way up at 20 pounds at 20,000 RPM. Hmm. So yeah. the fuel has to be there to support that, even though you don't see it on a dyno, because it's there. It's just that it's not being used to motivate the car. It's being used to drive the blower. Hmm. Mm. Okay, now what about spark plugs and uh, gapping? Because I got some NGKs up here for my LSA. Yeah, NGKs are good plugs. Um, we use, uh, I'm more concerned, I'm less concerned with the, the manufacturer of the spark plug, although there are some that I won't use, like a split fire. I, I'm not a big fan of E3 or any kind of the gimmicky plugs. But a typical NGK or we, we've used Denso sometimes only because they gave them a bunch of them. Um, I'm more concerned with two things. One, the heat range of the plug. So if we run a turbo or a blower motor, we'll run an, an eight or a nine or a 10 heat range sometimes. And then the, the plug gap. So we we bring it all the way down on boosted applications to about 19 or 20 thousandths. Mm. Okay, cool. That way you make it easier for the ignition to fire. If, you're, if the ignition's having to work hard to jump across that gap, it's not going to do it. It's lazy. It's like, <laughs> I'm going to pass on this one. You're going to have to catch me on the next round. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it just won't do that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hey, that was, yeah, we're getting schooled. I was about to yeah, say we're that. getting schooled on turbos, man. You, know? <laughs> you did Tur say I'm going to get them sooner or later, Richard. I think maybe I will. Turbos are turbos are good stuff. But but again, the thing is, that guys, guys ask me all the time, because obviously I do lots of turbo stuff. Well, is that your favorite thing? I'm like, no, it's not. The cool thing is that we get to choose. So some guys want all motor cars. That's awesome. Some guys want blower cars with big roots blowers sticking out of the hood. I can totally see why. You have a jet boat. It's got to have an 871 on it, obviously, with two carburetors on it. Um, twin screw blowers, very efficient, fit under the hood, do all kinds of good stuff. Turbos, obviously, very efficient and make lots of power per pound of boost. Some guys don't want to run the plumbing and the heat. They don't want to deal with all that stuff. The great thing is that if there was only one form of forced induction that was the best and everybody loved it and it was better than everything else, there would only be one. But there's not. There's lots of stuff for us to choose from and all of us get to be individuals and, and get to make the things that we want. I think also what it comes down to is like, you know, uh, simplicity and also looks. Because like yeah. with a supercharger, supercharger, I always felt that it was like a set and forget it. You yeah. know, like. You know, like, because, like, by the time you – and anytime you change boots, you got to change pulleys, and that's a pain. And then especially if you're talking with an LS, now you got to go and see the dyno or, or the tuner guy. You know, where it's well, the, the cool thing about the supercharger, and I, I remember I, – I wish I could give credit to the guy that wrote this, and I thought it was awesome, an awesome description, is that the supercharger sits down in the V of a V8 engine where God and nature intended it. And I thought <laughs> that that's, that's like perfect. That's just awesome. I wish I knew who wrote that, but whoever did, I, I salute you because that's an awesome description for us. Yeah, that, I like that. I like that yeah. a lot. You know, but the turbo, I mean, like if I was building the car flat out just for the track, straight quarter mile, I'm hitting the turbo because it's so tunable. Yeah, and it, and it will ultimately make more power per pound of boost. The one thing I can say is that, I do like um, I do like symmetry, and it's one of the things that I didn't like about. Like I drove around with a Vortec on my Mustang forever for I don't know eighty five thousand miles, so um, and and it worked really well, and it never let me down, and it's always awesome. But I didn't like the fact that when you lifted the hood, there was a Vortec on one side of the motor, and there wasn't one on the other side. I wanted there to be two of them so that it looked symmetrical, so that it would be, you know, it would, just would look cooler. And I didn't need it. It made it more, it made more than enough power, but I just wanted to have that visual appeal. Uh, well, I got, a, I got a question from Brian. Uh, he wants to know about coils. Uh, can you comment anything on the millisecond dwell? 
You want to put it up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of questions about coils. Can you comment on millisecond drill? When we set up, that, that's the one thing I like about running the Holly HP management system that I do. I, I'm not a tuner, but I use that a lot. And it's really easy to do for me to do the tuning at wide open throttle because it takes about five or six pulls and then it's all done. Doing the drivability is, is a whole different thing. But one of the things I like about that Holly is we can adjust the dwell time on the coil. And for us, uh, we run four to four and a half milliseconds on the coil. And that seems to produce enough spark. I mean, we've run more than 1,500 horsepower and 1,300 foot pounds on wow. the stock coils. So yeah. it's all I can tell you is when we do that with a tight enough plug gap um, and that setting on the dwell, that it seems to work and we don't get misfires. And, and that's just with a, that's with a stock coil or a stock set of coils that I know nothing about. Cause it came from, it came from some used motor that we had, you know, they weren't even new. Mm, mm -mm. See, I'm glad, I'm glad we got you on Rich, because you know, the whole thing is you pretty much telling everyone that you don't have to go and spend a lot of money to go out and play. You don't, yeah. you know? Yeah, there are, there are definitely ways to do it cheap. And like I said, this is a great time to be a performance enthusiast. There's, there's never been a time, nobody talked about thousand horsepower or, or mm -hmm. motors when I was growing up. That was, no. you know, we say that thousand is the new 500. And I think yes. probably we're going to get into a point where 1500 is going to become the new thousand. Wow. But, you know, if you think about a guy that had a 500 horsepower um, streetcar, he was the man. That's pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. And if you make that a thousand, all that happens is now I don't have traction even at 150 miles an hour, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's just, it borders on the ludicrous. And even with, even with the LS, like you say, you find most of your engines in the, in the, in the salvage yard. And yeah. when you said at 5.3s and, and 4.8s. Yeah. Because at one point you used to be able to find, well, my favorite LS engine is the LY6. You used to be yes. able to find those all over the place. And even now, you know, like at this point, you're finding the engines have like three, four hundred. Now, for testing purposes, they're really good. You, you're yeah. doing the right thing. But as far as someone going into a junkyard trying to pull out an engine, let's say you get lucky enough, you find a 6.0 and has two, three hundred thousand miles on it. Sure, you could put that engine in there, but you're going to be a little nervous. It's so, just broken in. Yeah, yeah. But what <laughs> I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing a video because I got uh, I went out and got all the parts. I'm going to test out the LS Pro stuff that Summit has because it's some okay. pretty good stuff. Yeah. And because what's happening is, like I said, you 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 don't want to go and put that 300 mile, 100,000 mile in your engine and 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 worry because I'll be nervous. I won't take that car anywhere. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know, without without uh, you know, what's it called, triple A. So yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to go and get the block. I'm going to have it machined, everything like that, and I'm going to point. This is the cam. This is the this is the, yeah. the 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 connecting rods. Just do it from soup to nuts. Rotate mask. I'm gonna use all LS Pro parts and uh, Pro LS parts, and we're just gonna see what happens. We're gonna take it to the dyno, and we're gonna see what kind of numbers we push. And it's gonna be a cool video. I might yeah, have to send it out to you to get dyno. <laughs> I, I I like that. I like the Pro LS stuff. I have some of their stuff for a 5.3 that we're putting together, and, and I like it. And I really like that LY6. That's the one that we made 1,543 horsepower with. And I, I'm surprised that that motor's still alive. I've I've run hundreds and hundreds of runs on that motor at the, like, eight 900,000 horsepower range with that motor and it just says look i'm 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 going to be here forever <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's a a cast aluminum ls3 aluminum heads you can't yeah. go wrong man i mean you just do a simple swap man and you're at that 500 range with those engines oh yeah easily just put a cam in that and it's and it's more than that yeah that they're they're good you know but yeah so that's the plan looking forward to it but we definitely got to get together rich and i want to tell you ready I'm going to tell people something that I know about you that no one here probably knows. All right. This man, he hunts, he traps. All, all of these guys know. <laughs> all of these guys probably know. I didn't know that this guy traps snakes. We were out to dinner. Oh, and he yeah. Was, it, yeah. He's a snake. He's a snake lover. He he catches and release. Yep. All, all catch and release. You know? I, I've been, I've been catching snakes since I think I caught my first snake at four or five years old. And I've been fascinated ever since. Like every year now, I, I've been for a long time. I was doing a snake log, so I would, I would detail what they were and how big they were and where I caught them and what the time of day and all that stuff was. Like like I was doing some sort of research, but I was the only one that was looking at it. 
but I would catch, um, I normally catch a hundred to 110 of them a year. The problem is, especially where we live, most of them are rattlesnakes because oh. we see more rattlesnakes than anything else. I'm going out not to find those because, you know, they're not any fun. I mean, they they just they, they, they're, they're kind of grumpy and they, you know, they're defensive and they rattle and they say, look, I'm going to bite you. Leave me alone. But we catch those and we film them and then we let them go. What I'm going out to find are the good snakes, like um, king snakes, which I love. is my favorite one. That's the ultimate catch for me. We only see three or four of those a year. We see lots of gopher snakes, um, sharp tails, ring necks, garter snakes. Um, and, and, and I always try to look when I go somewhere else. Like I was driving up to Reno and I was coming back and I just stopped off along the river and caught a water snake. <laughs> I was just walking down, being in nature, you know, stopping and being part of all that. And I'm like, hey, that's a that's a little water snake on there. And I reached in and got him and took pictures of him and stuff. And then we just let him go because, like I said, I, I I like them. It's just something weird about me. What can you tell me about copperheads? I they're beautiful, <laughs> but they're. <laughs> The place I'm thinking of relocating to is known for copperheads. I just want to know what I'm in for. <laughs> I, the, I can tell you um, a couple of things about snakes. First of all, snakes are not aggressive. Regardless of what somebody tells you about snakes, snakes are only defensive. If you look at the situation where you walk up on a snake, you're big. You're five, six, seven feet, whatever you are. And a snake is really small. And so everything that's out in the world is trying to eat a snake they're they're fairly low i mean they're they're not as low as a mouse or a lizard is that they're going to eat but in the grand scheme of things they're fairly low on the food hierarchy here so what they do is go oh no there's something big here trying to eat me and the first thing that they'll try to do is get away if you give them access to getting away they'll get away if if you corner them then they'll uh get in a defensive posture and hiss or strike at you because all they're saying is, hey, look, leave me alone. I'm scared. I don't want you to eat me. That's all that, that's all that they know. Um, copperheads are beautiful, and they're, they're a lot like rattlesnakes. Um, they're not going to chase after you. They're not going to come into your house. They're not going to do any of that stuff. Um, if you find them, if people find them, it's normally by accident. Like when I go out and look for snakes, I'm out in the wilderness by myself. But I have to actively seek them. I have to go lift up rocks, lift up logs, be in places where I probably shouldn't be. <laughs> um, and, and obviously, I'm very careful because the last thing I want to do is get bit and having to spend time in the hospital. But yeah, we have to actively seek them. Very, and I'm and I'm out there a lot, and very rarely do I ever run across one. Um, and I and I do catch the snakes barehanded. Somebody's asking about that all the time. Um, wow. Very rarely do I run across a snake that's just out in the open. Sometimes you'll find them sunning themselves or you'll, you'll, you know, the, the stars will align where you guys will intersect. He will have been crawling across a place where you happen to be walking and you will meet and, you know, and then, then I will catch them. But that's very, very rare. And usually I have to look for them to find them. And that's me, like I said, lifting up boards and tin and all that stuff to try to find them. It's, it's very rare that people run across them. And if they get bit, it's usually because somebody steps over a log or a rock and the snake is on the other side um, because they like to be in an area where they can get a little bit of sun sometimes, depending on the temperature. A lot of people don't realize they don't like hot weather. Snakes don't like hot weather. They, they, they have to thermal, they can't thermoregulate so that their body temperature has to be maintained within a certain range. They don't like to be too cold. They don't like to be too hot because if they get that, then they die. So they'll no, be in an area where hot. I thought they loved the heat. No, they do not like the heat. If you put a snake at a hundred degree temperature, he'll die. Wow. Mm. Yeah, they, they don't like it. Um, the but they like to be in an area like right under a rock where they can be out just a little bit and the prey can't get them and they can also move in and escape. Somebody steps over that rock and they step down right by the snake. The snake says, Oh, something's trying to get me, and they strike at it. So, you know, if if you're not walking in the wilderness and looking for them, the odds of you finding one are going to be pretty rare. Yeah, I was watching a video about this, and the guy had said, uh, you know, kind of the same thing. He said, you know, humans really aren't in too much danger. And he says, and even if you do get bit, he says, it's it's not really, you know, it's not like a rattlesnake bite. He says, but your pets, he says, your dogs and cats, if you have them yeah. out with you on a trail, they're a lot more susceptible to being bit. And he says, but usually dogs 
fare better with the bite, and it's just like a dose of, of uh, Benadryl, and it'll clear up. Yeah, the and if as long as it's a big enough dog, and then they don't have a problem. The problem with dogs is that the way that they approach something is with their nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the snake, that's also the way that a wolf or a fox approaches a snake to eat it. Right. So right. their their first reaction is to strike at that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And my I take my dogs without with me all the time. Um, because we had a ranch that we would go to and we they would get to run up and be dogs and chase squirrels and birds and every turkeys and everything. Um, and that we never had any problems because I would make sure that they would stay away when I was going to an area where I figured that there probably were, were snakes. And like I said, we never ran across any out in the open where, where they were in any danger. Yeah, that's good. Wow. So, so have you ever been bitten? I've been bitten a lot, but not never by rattlesnake. I, I won't, I don't want that to happen. <laughs> oh, <I bet. laughs> yeah king snakes and gopher snakes and and those kinds of snakes i just pick those up and then a lot of times they will turn and try to bite you again not because they're being mean but they're they want to get away and then usually what happens is after a minute or so they just go oh this guy's not going to eat me and then they just calm down and then they then they're like pets then then your hand is warm they like it and they and then they're then they're happy to be there some of them different snakes have different personalities some of them are, are like aggravated the whole time. And a lot of that has to do with temperature. If you're catching them when they're hot, they're gonna be more aggravated. If you catch them when it's cold, like it's 60 or 65 degrees outside, and they're, they're sitting somewhere, maybe trying to get some sun, you pick them up, sometimes they don't even move. Same with rattlesnakes, they, they might not even rattle because it's, it's too cold. They're, they're, they don't move around a lot. They're trying to conserve their heat. When you say king snake, are you talking about a cobra? No, a king snake. It's a like a California king snake. It's black and white banded. They're they're the snakes that eat rattlesnakes. Wow. Really? The thing to do is approach them with a CO2 extinguisher and like give them a quick little <laughs> blast. That would like, that would that would definitely stop them. Actually, yeah. the best thing to do is if you walk up and see a snake, is just walk around it and go on about your business and let them do their thing. Yeah. So so what you're saying is we can't shoot them. <laughs> well, it's hard. People do that all the time, and I've had people tell me how how tough they are. Yeah, we went rattlesnake hunting. I'm like, that's you and a shotgun and a rattlesnake. It's a, that's really not very fair. Yeah, Lewis, that's a small target, man. It's you know, it's slippery and moving. That's why yeah. you use those, uh, the you use those CTI bird shots, guys. You use a lot of that for um for yeah, I, too. yeah. That that would definitely do it. Yeah, yeah. Again. It, a person getting the better of a snake is is 99.9% .9 of the time. People run them over and, you know, do all kinds of dumb stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, some, some, my wife, my wife does not like them. She, no. she, she hates them. And so I'd rather I fight a dog home. than to mess with a snake. Yeah, right? Yeah, I, I used to bring them home and we would take them to the school so that the kids could see them, you know. You know, so how long would it take for them to be like a pet? Let's say you found one of those king snakes. A, a minute or two. As soon as as soon as they, most of them that I've caught, as soon as they realize that you're not going to hurt them, then they're just they're they they still kind of usually want to get away, but they're they're never going to bite you. They they don't they don't do that anymore. Hmm. Wow. They just, I, they just I crawl you around. Said you in the box, they'd be like, ah. Oh yeah, <laughs> we set it. We set them in a container that has holes and stuff in it. Like I'll bring one home. And we'll put it in a container and then I'll take it to school to show the kids at school. And then I'll take it back out to where I caught it and let it go. And after the initial catch, it, it will never bite anybody. Well, I mean, it might bite somebody else if they were smacking it or something, but oh, so it, they would remember they, you. They would, they would never bite. Well, I don't know that they remember me, but the problem is when you take them to a school and you're showing a bunch of kids, the kids get all excited about it. And they like, you don't want to like, you know, put your hand right up on their face because then they think again something might be trying to attack them. But I just holding on to it and and in a non-threatening you know posture, they're not going to bite anybody. I don't know if I want to take that chance though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of, and again, a lot of that is confidence. It's just like with a dog. If you if you see a dog out on the road and you're the one that's in charge, you're the alpha. The dog knows that. When you're not, the dog also knows that. And mm -hmm. so. I, I, I'm not afraid of dogs. I'm not afraid of snakes. I'm not afraid of sharks. I'm not, just nothing. I guess sharks. What, what was, what yeah, was, I've, I've been shark diving too. See, 
White folks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> My wife, man, she's white and she's always trying to pet something or, or touch something. I'm like, dude, <laughs> yeah. it's going to eat you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a good shark story. I was, um, we oh, were in, we, we went to well, Mexico. We went to Mexico and um, we went on a we went on a shark dive and this was when we were in Cabo I think and they drove us I don't know two and a half or three hours away from there to this little tiny fishing village and when I say it's a fish, fishing village it's like one shack where they make food everybody there shares the same trailer to load their boat back into the water and it used to be a fishing village and then now it's a diving village because they they want to preserve it now because after they realize that people are doing diving that that this was a better commerce for them they started doing that so we go out um this guy's going to take us out to a a sunken ship not a spanish galleon it's like a munition ship and it's fairly small and so we're driving out in this boat and i'm with the captain he's the young guy and i'm talking to him and he's like yeah he goes um we're gonna go out and i said well how far are we going he's like eh, it's about i don't know a mile and a half or two miles out and i said well where's your gps and he said what do you mean? I said, well, you're taking us out two miles out into the ocean. And, and I said, and you're going to drop us down on a boat that's, you know, 10 or 20 <laughs> feet. I said, how are you know where you are? He goes, well, you see that house right over there and that tree. And then there's that rock right over there and that other tree. And he said, I just triangulate that. And he goes, when I tell you to go down, you go down. And he said, the boat will be right there. I said, and this boat's like, you know, 10 or 20 feet. He said, yeah. I said, I got 20 bucks says that you can't do that. And he goes, okay. He said, but when I tell you to go in, you go in. So we go out and we get to the point. He goes, okay, get ready, get ready. And he goes, okay, go in. And we dive and go in. I looked down and I just reached up and gave him the 20 bucks because right below me was the thing. But so we go down and we're diving and there were bull sharks down there. So as we're diving down, there's like six, seven, eight foot bull sharks swimming around this, this sunken ship. Very cool. The visibility was great. The bull sharks, um, I can see why people don't like them and, and why the as the shark swimming by, I realize that the shark certainly thinks that he's in charge here and, the, and he may well have been. So no, no amount of my attitude was going to change that. But we, we do our dive and come back up. And as we're going in, I'm talking to the guy again because now he's my best friend. And he said, you need to come out here in this bay when there's tiger sharks here. He said, the female tiger sharks swim here and they could be 13, 14, 15 feet. I said, oh, I would love that. He goes, yeah. He goes, those are much better. I would never go in and swim with those bull sharks like you guys did. I would only go with the tiger sharks. I'm like, yeah, I know you're telling me that now on our <laughs> way back and not when we were going out there. I'm like, oh, man. But man, was, he got paid before you went out, right? <laughs> exactly. He knew. He knew. Yeah. No, but he, he, was, he was a young guy and they, they're, they had been in this area for generations. And it was just, you know, it was an awesome experience. Mm -hmm. awesome. awesome and now i want to go to a place called off of uh i think it's florida or the bahamas it's called tiger beach and so now they have big tiger sharks there and great hammerheads and stuff and i want to go there and i just want to pet a tiger shark i don't know rich i know <laughs> so rich these are the fellas that these are every every week fellas awesome we got john brian and jim What's up, guys? How you doing? Oh, just listening Good. and learning. Is that a firebird in the background? Yeah. What year is it? 70. The best year ever. Uh -oh, someone's it's actually up. an 81 that's made into a 70. The even better. You're hmm. back to 80. Oh, uh, new sheet metal. That's cool. Making a 70 the hard way. They're yeah. hard. A 70 is going to be hard to find, though, isn't it? A real one? If, if you find one, they're like a gazillion dollars. Yeah. And you got to hope the guy did a half decent job of, you know, restoring or they're it. Or they're rusted down into nothing, I would imagine, too. I The ones I found that, you know, you don't even want. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's hard to get. Yeah, 70 with, to get it. With my, with my race car experience, it was a lot easier to go to National Parts Depot and buy a bunch there of China go. recreation parts. And just it's perfect. Just build your own way, throw away everything and just mount it all up. No, that's perfect. Hey, uh, Rich, before we get too carried on, 
Um, I had a question. I saw that uh, you were born in Washington, D.C. Did you grow yeah. up on the East Coast and did you hang out on this side for how long? No, I was actually born in um, Andrews Air Force Base. So mm -hmm. I guess wow. technically it's Maryland. Yeah. Um, but I was only there for a short time because my dad was in the Navy. So he was oh. stationed there, but we moved back out here. Um, probably, I mean, I was probably only there. I don't even know, even know if I was there a year. Oh, okay. Well, that's, I'm, I'm in the Silver Spring area, which is okay. in between, uh, Baltimore and Washington, DC and my routes yeah. down around in that area. I was just, like I said, I skimmed through, uh, your uh, bio and all your info just so that I can uh, give you a hard time and ask questions. But I was just curious <laughs> you, on you the uh, DC so part. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just curious on the uh, DC part. Uh, it's not well, a common, you're, when you have that type of, uh, uh, when you're born in DC, there's not very many, uh, there's not a lot of people actually that have that if yeah. it's on their birth certificate, you know, it's not yeah. a, it's not a uh, a big number or whatever. So oh yeah, I'll give you another fun fact, Brian. I know you didn't go down through my bio, and, and I'm not ready to pet a tiger shark, but <laughs> I was also, I was born on a Navy base, and my birth certificate is a U.S. Navy issued birth certificate with a seal, and the DMV wouldn't accept it for proof of birth for an enhanced license. Yeah. Nice. Wow. What are you kidding? Yeah, I said, are you kidding me? This is like a U.S. Navy government yeah. seal. And you, no, How you, more official can you get? I said, you can't get any more official. It's, you know, like if I was born in a Pentagon, maybe you know, who knows? But but yeah. I said, no, you need the old black and white birth certificate that everybody. Yeah. I, I don't. I've never had one of these my whole life. This thing is done. You know, you, yeah. I, I waited a year and I went you to. You gotta go to Kinko's and make it black and white, and then they'll accept it. Yeah, they've been no. like a, the, the New York birth certificate is that is that just that black and white looking thing? So yep. yeah, that's, that's, it's that's mine, it's crazy. Yeah. It's Brooklyn crazy that you say that about you know uh, official documents and stuff like that because they don't accept. You know, like my mom wasn't born in a hospital. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, you know, when you 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 still have people that don't have that type. You know, you just have some. Yeah piece of paper that they've written down that this uh, you were born on this date you know and people look at it like how can that be a legal document or whatever you know yeah, yeah. so they, they only know they only know one thing it's like when you go into the auto parts store they only know your make and model i'm like I, no i built this supercharger and put it on a different motor and it has a whole different assembly on it so we're not going to talk about your make and model because i don't have any of that exactly right exactly. Yeah, I, I go through that all the time when i have to go to the auto parts store to get something because this car is a big block Chevy in it. Yeah. And a turbo 400. So anytime I have to deal with somebody that's sitting in an auto parts store, this is a 1971 SS 396. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, you, you, go. you know what the system is now and you know how to work it, right? Yeah, I, 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 I work. That. I worked at a speed shop, so I had to get around that we stuff. We talked there about that go. a long time ago. I, I learned it back in the 70s I, I, with the Pontiac I had and still have. I put a Chevy engine in it, but, you know, you couldn't get Pontiac parts back then. Dealership stuff was, you know, this is going back into the late 70s, early 80s. So I said, hey, I just started ordering stuff for a big block Chevelle. And yeah. it fits, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Bingo, bango, all done. But, yeah, you got to know how to work the system. That's exactly what it is. So yeah. speaking of Fords, here's our resident Ford guy. There he is, the man, the, like, myth, I still, the legend. I'm a Ford owner. The other resident Ford guy, I should say. The other, yeah, for tonight. Nice. <laughs> Vince. Hey, Vince. Yeah, not a whole lot, guys. Going on, Vince. Richard, doing, Richard, buddy? Richard. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> you had to squeeze a 550-inch Ford to get 1,000 horsepower? I, I've never made a thousand horsepower with one of those. Um, oh. I'm trying to think. I don't think I have. I think we. I think we made nine so, something with the with the TFS uh, A460 headed deal. I think that that's the most that I've made. I don't remember doing a thousand. I I may have, but I, I'm just what, not remembering. The, the the video the video was the one where it was the comparison of the. The Ford versus the the 455 versus the 460, and then okay. and then when you did the Kazi head, which 
the compression was a little low and some other things. And uh, the, uh, we didn't think that the uh, intakes were compatible for the Chevy versus the Ford. And yeah, but it's, I don't know. There's, I, I, I could be rude and say something, but I won't. But uh, I did, I did, lo- I did want uh, Terry to go ahead and admit in the video that I sent him of yours where you admitted that the LS was, you know, kind of a copy of the four, a small block Ford. And I don't know, Terry, I, I, <laughs> I admitted as, much, that. as much as I Terry. Probably said I have no idea because I, I, I don't understand what that, what that myth is. I don't understand why people are arguing about that. Well, I mean, you can well, take all it, you I can, know is who has it now. I don't, <laughs> I don't know where it came from. You know, as far as the origin, you know, like there's a myth that Ford passed on the, the LS platform. Well, it was offered to them first. That's, I, that's I, I don't know. I don't know any of that stuff. I don't know any of that history. I don't know any of the. I don't even know why people would argue about that. Like, it, what, the, the way I see it, it is, if, it, if they what, passed what? on it. If they passed on it, that means they're stupid. <laughs> you know? why, why, why can you, why can you put an LS head on a on a Windsor block? Oh, because they have similar more spacing. Is that why? More spacing and bolt pattern. More than that. More yeah. I got to see this. I, I I'm not sure that it can. I I got to see it. I yeah. No, I, I think, can't see I how that could all match that, right? up. Terry, it's been done many times before. You can, bolt, you can physically but bolt my, an LS but head my question, to it. my question wouldn't be whether or not that fits on there. My question is, let's assume that your conspiracy theory goes all the way in that direction. Let, let's assume that somebody copied something or that something is very similar. But w- why does that matter, though? I mean, I don't I don't understand what the thing is. Well, it's it's just a little friendly ribbing between Terry and myself because. Oh, well, no, then that's I, totally worth it. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's all you got to tell me. If, you, if it's well, you putting down Terry, then count me in. I'm all in. Uh, well, <laughs> no, my, my, my thing is I, I, I've had Mopars. I've had Oldsmobiles. I've had Pontiacs. I've had Chevys. I've had Mustangs. Right now, I happen to have three 66 Mercury Cyclones. Two are two-door hard tops and one's a convertible. So I'm building an aluminum headed 466 for the two door. And then uh, I've got an S code 390 that I'm going to rebuild for the convertible. And then uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the last one. So Hold I in. like those cars. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't said that. <laughs> does, okay. Does anybody here have, here's what I'm looking for. A 429 super Cobra jet heads. Who has a bunch of sets just laying around? Yeah, Ray might have. Uh, Ray, Ray has I, them. Ray, I'm a little light right now. Yeah, <laughs> I think, I think I will, Smith has a set because he's. Yeah. I, I mean, I would like pay that. three or four hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah, what, what cast, Richard? What castings are you wanting? I, I want to. I what? What we want to do is, I want to build a replica of a 429 Cobra Jet or Super Cobra Jet. So we want to build the motor, run it on the dyno, show people what it did, and then I can give back whatever thing that I borrowed for, for to make this motor. I did it with the Boss 351, the Boss 302, all the DZ, the LT1, the L76, all of those. And I want to do it to the 429, to that Super Cobra Jet one. I also oh, have yes. a Buick 455 Stage 1 going together and an LS6 and a 396, 375 horse motor going together. I'll I'll ask around between a couple of the engine builders that I know and some people that I'll check with my buddy in Vegas and see if Benny knows uh, if he's knows anybody out there that might have something or I'll check with Philip and a couple of the other guys that I know that might have that kind of a cylinder head that they're looking for. Okay. So. Yeah, just we just need a stock set. We found some that guys have ported and done lots of crazy stuff with. Unfortunately, I I just would rather have it just be stock so we could put it on there and go, hey, look. When Ford built that, this is what it, what you could have expected, and here's how it compares to some of the other stuff that was out at the time. I'm, I'll talk to my buddy Evan because he's he's in the middle of building a a, a a Wood Brothers Talladega clone car for the street. Oh, cool! Ooh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't that a was that a 427 side oiler though in the in the Woods car? I thought it was a 429. I don't well, know. Depends upon what year, year was it was. It? Depends on the year. Uh, yeah. 
I think it's a 67 or 68. 67 or 68. Oh, 29. Yeah, it probably would have yeah. been a 429. Four, yeah. Four, 427. So it, it could be, that. if it's a 68, it could be either. Yeah, 67 yeah. probably would have been a 427. I, for, but I forget what eight. year the car is. They found this car and it's, and it's perfect for them to just leave the patina and yeah. re recreate it like a Wood Brothers car. You oh, know, that's awesome. And put it on the street. So it's cool. They've they've upgraded the front suspension already to uh, a, a, like a bolt-in cross-member deal. They yeah. cut away all of the stock stuff and put put this whole cradle in it. And no, that's I cool that they're that. gonna. It's cool that they're gonna drive it because we get yeah. Like, and, and they're that. running them. They're running like a six-speed manual transmission. Yeah, in it. That's what's up. You got to do it like that. I love the yeah, whole patina yeah, of yeah, these yeah. old cars because oh yeah, they're not gonna paint the car at all. Nah, it's already, you need to spend like twenty thousand dollars on a paint you know, job. Nah, white and red. You know? Yeah, it's it's perfect. Put that money into the suspension and the drivetrain and have yeah. fun. And yeah, and yeah. just drive it. I would. They they get a lot of cars in at West Tech that are like SEMA cars and stuff, and these things are. You know, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars. Like they have paint jobs on them that I don't even like to walk near because it's just, mm -hmm. it's just way too inviting for me to like just walk over and fall and scratch it. And I just, I don't like cars like that because they don't, they don't get driven. They get, you know, the, you you put gloves on them and push them into the trailer, and I'm like, that's not a car. That's not that's with a, not my with idea. A diaper, gotta clean them with a diaper. And, uh, <laughs> no, that's I just get in it and go do donuts and stuff. That's what I want to. I want to know more about West Tech. How many dino cells? What goes on over there? Um, West I, Tech I watch, has. I two, watch Engine Masters. I see yeah. those shows. West Tech has so. two engine dinos. Both of them are Superflow 902s. They have one chassis dino. They've got a, a Superflow airflow bench. They have a injector machine. They got a lot and a bunch of lifts and stuff. And they have another um, power mark dyno that they just got that is probably going to replace maybe one of the 902s. Um, so they, and they've been in business for a long time. Like I said, I think I've been going there for 25 or 30 years now. Oh, it's hard and to Yeah, it's a, it's a nice facility. We just got done filming a few episodes of Engine Masters there. It was, it was a lot of fun. And those guys are, you know, they're, they're good guys to hang out with because they're real car guys. Richard, yeah, do you watching, like going to the... I was watching the, an episode um, where, I don't know, Brule blew up one of the dinos or something. I guess that was I, I last year, though, because this stuff is filmed yeah. so far back. Because Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that. I'll have to ask Steve about it. So did you have a question? Say, I was going to say, do you, um, did you like going to the, um, the engine masters that they used to have, or I guess they're still doing them at UNOH? The, I went to the the second or third engine masters challenge, if that's what you're talking about, where, where we all built engines and they were right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was a lot of fun, but it was a, it was a lot of work um, to give you an idea the motor that I put together to be in that. And I was ended up being a finalist in that. Um, I had 450 dyno poles on it. So wow. yeah, it took me that long to find, cause we're, you know, you get to a point where you try a lot of things and in Engine Masters, we're all looking for average power numbers. So from this RPM to this RPM, all, all that matters is average power, not peak, not peak torque, not any of that. Just whatever the average number is, that's what you're looking to try to do. So it's a different kind of build. So you find lots of stuff that goes like this to the curve. You know, it makes more torque, it makes less horsepower, and, and it ends up being the same number. So you find a lot of things, I found a lot of things that didn't work, that didn't improve my average score. And so we really had to try a lot of different things to get the thing up to where it was Bischoff and Kazi and, and that kind of level. So it took a lot. When I was sitting there talking to those guys, when we were at Engine Master, some guy walked up. Yeah, I only had three pulls on my motor. We're like, you're an idiot. <laughs> There's no way you put together a motor the first time out. Even a guy like John Kazi doesn't put a motor together the first time out and have it be like at that level. Nobody does that. Right. Yeah, it's it's. I, I've got a friend there in Michigan, Randy Malik. He competed with that and has built engines for years. And he said the same thing. He goes, people don't realize when we were doing engine masters. He goes, it's not just you know, grab some parts, throw it together, and take it to the yeah. dyno. He says he goes, they're fighting for specific horsepower and looking for numbers, looking yeah. for you know. And he goes, it's just he goes, it's a lot more work than people think. Mm. Yeah, when I when I was doing it, you took the average horsepower and the average torque and added them together. 
and then you have this number of the two of them together. When you did that, the top three guys, um, I think the difference between first, second, and third was three numbers. So they're going out to decimal points on the numbers to decide that's how much you're looking for. Wow. So it's it's a lot of absolutely everything. Yeah, you you definitely see a lot of first class engine builders do, doing that oh, there's, like there's, said, they yeah, just the, every nut bolt they know every inch of that motor yeah. inside now. That's why I went there. I went there to learn from those guys because those guys know. I, I'm not an engine builder. I'm I I I'm a junkyard guy, and I'm I count myself as an engine assembler, which is a different thing. That's why it took me so long to try to find stuff that actually worked. Because one thing I do know how to do very well is I'm not a test, so I can test lots and lots of stuff. And that's exactly what I did to find out what works. Now, fellas, you got to remember this guy, Richard, he was on uh, the fastest car. So if you want to check him out there. Yeah, I saw you. You were riding a Segway, weren't you? Something like that? The um, Yeah, it was not a Segway. It was a um, hoverboard. A hoverboard. You know, yeah, I, I, still, I still have it. I use it all the time at West Tech. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when I, I go, because um, at, at the end, if you've ever seen any of the stuff that I've done at West Tech, um, I'll come in and do 10 cylinder heads or 10 camshafts or all kinds of crazy stuff. And by the time I'm done with all that testing, like it's a mess. And so I got to clean all that stuff up. So having the hoverboard means that I can just jam around to the different places in West Tech and put all that stuff away to get all that stuff cleaned up when you're done. Because you got to do that, man. When You know, nice. when you make a mess, you got to clean up. Man, yeah, I just looking at those things. I break my ankles just looking at them, man. <laughs> yeah, lot, lots of people have. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, I gotta jump off. But Richard, man, I really appreciate you coming on. And like I tell everybody, you're family now, so you can come on anytime just Dude, to I'm hang ready. out. You can come on just to hang out, or if you have something you need to to get out to the public, let us know, man. We can get you in about motors or snakes or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Cool. We haven't even got into the American Ninja Warrior stuff, man. We got lots more to talk about. Okay, well, wait. I'm, I'm leaving, but Ray takes over. He's the after party. <laughs> All right, host. So, yeah, he's the after party host. So uh, I thought this was the hour. Yeah, the who uh, Vince? What was that? The music hour. Music well, hour. They talk know, music. We morph. We we cover everything. Everything. <laughs> yeah. Everything. Yeah. We'll but hey, Richard, we'll probably see you out at SEMA. I, I don't know if I'm going to be going, actually, to SEMA, so we'll have to see how things go. Okay. Boy, a okay. lot of people are kind of yeah, it's getting, on that. It's getting funny, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I'm not too happy over that. Yeah, it's a, I've obviously been going for years and years and years, um, and, and I like it, although it's a lot of the same stuff for me. Mm-hmm. But um, the thing that the thing that I do day. like about it is being able to go out and see everybody. That's kind of why I go. That's that's going to be my main thing this year, I think. Uh, but yep. if if nobody's going, I'm, I might stay home and stay on the couch, I guess. <laughs> I, I'm usually on the dyno during. Season. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, 2019, Richard kind of tackled me when I was walking into SEMA. You know, we had to, <laughs> you know we had to do a little video. I'll throw a body block. I'm not above that. No, no, my man tried to, you know, try to take me out, man. You know, I was like, yo, you know, that's still roughness. You know, he tried to grab me out. Give him a chokehold. Yeah, yeah. And then we was uh kicking it with uh what's it called? Um Aaron and Emily Reeves. Yeah. From Last Box Garage. That's what we were waiting yep. for. You were waiting for him. And uh so that was fun. So I, I hope SEMA happens because it's it's a good time. Yeah. And yeah. you know, you get a chance to talk to these people and and with your hair down. With your hair down, exactly. You know, you get to see them. You see the real person. And uh, yeah. Lewis, thanks for having me on, man. Yeah. All right, anytime, man. You're always welcome. Appreciate All right, it. fellas, I will see you guys later. Lewis, be easy. All brother. right, Lewis, Lee. Be safe. Peace. Yeah. All right. Very cool. And then there was five. Six. <laughs> five after I leave. You know. Six. Five, five, five. I, have, I have to head on off myself too. I got a couple of things to get ready for for tomorrow. It's but already seven thirty. Man, how long have we been on here? About an hour and thirty. Oh, hour and a half. Yeah. Hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. That's nothing. We do three hours sometimes. Yeah. But Richard, I was on with um. I was on with Uncle Tony for I. I think we were on for three or four hours. It was a long time. How wow. long ago? How long ago was that, Richard? That you were on with him. I don't, I'm thinking it was, I don't know, six or eight months ago, probably. I'd have to go back and look and see. 
I'm having him on my radio show in two weeks. Yeah. I keep him in rotation, but now I got to go. You got to gotta go through Kathy. You got to go through his wife because he doesn't answer anything. So I guess he's, he's just too busy. Is, is that his booking agent? Yeah. He's too busy filing points and playing with drum breaks. So you got to, <laughs> you got to go through Kathy. That's how yeah. I finally got the hidden, you know, the hidden phone number and, and email. So I, I got the in now. So. Yeah, he's um right now he's not too happy with me because we did the test recently where we tested the piston flipping thing that he's so fond of talking about. Right, right, right. Yeah, we did a back to back test on that and it just showed zero horsepower. Okay. Yes. And, and so he you know, he kind of came unglued about that, and which is unfortunate because I, I really asked him to be on there to talk to him about it because I there's so much more stuff to go over because you know there's limitations in what we can show. In, in that kind of dyno testing, we could do chassis dyno, we could change the acceleration rate, we could change a lot of other things that may or may not show if there's something else there. And I wanted to go over all that, but he got <laughs> he got a little bit upset, I think. You know, well, educate me a little. I came like in on the middle of his his talking about, you know, there was a time where he was talking about that all the time with the guys and, and saying, yeah. like, it's tried and true, I've been doing this for 25 years. I never heard about that. Uh, yeah. and, and I'm older than he is, so I never heard about that. And and you know, but it doesn't. I was curious of what the hell he was. He was actually taking the pistons and turning them 180 degrees. Yeah, what Why? he's doing is the factory has um, pin offset. Basically, the pin obviously is offset to one side of the piston, and right. so he's changing uh, the. He, theoretically, you're changing because we went down the rabbit hole in this, and, and Freiberger and Dulcich really, really research this we talked to billy we talked to all the piston guys we talked i mean there was a lot of discussion that went on because we want to find out if there was a change what do we attribute that to so changing, basically all you have to do is dwell the piston time from, and speed yeah all, all of it you're changing cam timing there's a lot of things the problem is that when you do the math on what you're changing the amount that you're changing these things is really really tiny so we we basically just flip the piston around and put it on the other side so that you have the the you know there's a little dot on the piston it's now aiming in the back you have the chamfer in the correct spot that you've changed the pin offset from the major to the minor thrust side and so the theory is that you're changing side loading you're changing dwell time you're changing and billy went over this we're changing the acceleration rates to and from um, top dead center, you're changing the time when the piston is placed at um, maximum cylinder pressure, you're changing effective cam timing. So you're changing a lot of different things. It's just that, like I said, when we did the test, we were looking at a repeatability factor of the motor to a decimal point percentage past the one horsepower. So this motor was exactly repeatable. And then when we did it, it repeated again exactly and and the thing that surprised me most about all of this is that i mean this was a, a junkyard motor and then it was that repeatable but also when we put pistons and the ring assemblies in another bore that we lost nothing <laughs> we lost we didn't change the power at all yeah 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 well you know one of the things i've learned from watching Tony and talking to him for a, a while now is once his mind is locked in on something, <laughs> he is yeah. locked in and, and that's okay. You know, you, you can't change it, but yeah. like he doesn't have the hard scientific data. He's a see the pants kind of guy. Yeah. And, and that's okay too. You know, that's okay too. But um, yeah, I was, uh, I, I was always wondering about that because I didn't, um, he didn't fully, he didn't explain it pretty much at all just that i don't, hey, I don't this honestly thing. think that he had the he doesn't have the technical background i think right. to know all of those things that were happening it's right. just something that he read in the mopar bible basically and he's been doing it for a long time and that's all fantastic and i told him when i was first on his show i said this is interesting stuff i said i understand what you're doing and i understand some of what's changing here and i'd like to do the math on it to find out about all of it but because of what i do for a living i want to test it back to back I want to see if there's 10 horsepower. That's awesome. I want to find that. Right. You know, if it loses 10 horsepower, that's also awesome. But whatever the thing is, I want to be able to quantify it. And I, I just think that that's not what he wanted. No, right. Yeah, right. When you, when you look Show at that, me the numbers. You think yep, that the, that's, the, the that's theoretical 
holds enough water that there should be something there but when you flesh it out and i and i like dealing with yeah and i like dealing with guys that want the actual data like i have no vested interest in whatever happens if i put this cam in and put this cam in i tell people this cam did this and this cam did this i'm not going to tell you which cam to get i don't sell cams i don't sell heads i don't do any of that it's just the data and the data is whatever the data is and honestly if this just said a cam and this said b cam i would be happy with that because i don't care i just want to bring the information so other guys can decide here here's the power curve if you like that power curve get that camshaft exactly. if you don't something like I don't that care. So you have that information and you can say okay yeah. well here's what i'm looking for you know yeah. between three and 65 where am i getting the most torque the most horsepower where is it the exactly flattest? more, more data <laughs> And click okay take that camshaft done see you later bye so yeah. how many how many times have you seen an engine where you've put a combination together but you've done it in other engines uh, over time as well yeah. and this engine just seemed to be like the freak like you know, we talk about factory freaks yeah how often does that rear its its ugly head in the in the data collection world um i've not put together a lot of exact combinations um, because the, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, and, and this was the comment <laughs> uh, that you made about the Ford stuff, is that when I put together motors, I very, very rarely do I ever put together a combination that's designed to make maximum power. Guys that go racing are looking to make as much power as they can. I'm almost never doing that. When I do a test, it's we put this combination together usually, and then now we're going to test five or six or eight or ten other things on it. So it's, it's more of a learning experience than it is. Like I said, I'm not an engine builder. There are guys that are really very good at that. And if they're putting together a drag race motor that they want to make a million horsepower with, that's a different thing than I do. What I do is put this motor together and then now let's run a single plane intake manifold and now a bigger carburetor and now a nitrous kit and all that stuff. So it's a different deal. The only experience I have in what you're talking about is I've run lots and lots of junkyard motors that should theoretically make the same power and then some of them do better than others, but I we kind of attribute that to wear and and maintenance. Okay, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. I got about two more minutes, and I got to get going, guys. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on tonight. It's very, very unbelievably yeah. interesting, awesome. and uh, very. I was ready to start crying. Why? <laughs> Well, talking about turbos and fuel oh, yeah. injection, all this other stuff, and I'm like, I'm just a dinosaur that likes big blocks with nitrous. Yeah, I, I've run lots of those. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and John, every, I'm a car, I'm a carb guy too. I every still want every to motor, I I like every motor. People ask me, "What's your favorite one?" I'm like, "It's whatever the next one that I'm putting up on the dyno is the is the one that I like the best." Through through a lot of the forums that I that I go on, I hear a lot about you know the the ebay chinese turbos yeah and that's like always the big joke but listening to what you said now i'm thinking when i do the black trans am the 81 yeah. that i own that's a whole that's a car's not even here maybe i'll just put twin china turbos on that thing it's it's really easy to make a lot of power i mean i we put we did a the, i did a, the other cool a junkyard big turbos, block with those it makes a lot of power. You don't even power. really need an exhaust system when you run a turbo. They're no, so they're quiet. quiet. Yep. You know, I could just. I remember the first time I saw a Grand National run. run. <laughs> yeah, John, so do you want I, me to get you a know. pair of turbos? Not when I'm ready to work on that project after this one's done, then I might, I no. might go with a, you know, John, John I'll, I'll get you a pair of turbos. turbos. I'll tell you, but I'm going to tell you one thing about me though. Can you get those turbos in matched sets left, right? I hate the fact that everybody buys the same turbo. And then when you set them up and plumb them, they're not identical. Yeah. You want Otherwise, mirror image turbos. I want mirror image turbos yeah. because I'm a, I'm a stickler like that in terms of plumbing. And to me, mirror image turbos would just be so much easier to set up. They have those. VS Racing has inexpensive mirror image turbos because yeah. uh, the guys from Nelson Racing have some real expensive ones, but the the guys from VS Racing have different ones, so you can you could make that happen. You know, because if you think about it, and and you know you mount them, and then you put 
the outlets next to each other. You can mold yeah. them into. No, I'm I'm shape. I'm all in it on the symmetry. Two. That's it's yep. yeah, total. It's just eat. I see everybody does. They just buy two of the same part number, mm -hmm. and usually the driver side winds up being the easy way to go, and then the passenger side is like out in left field and hooking back around. And I'm like, yeah. You know, what about turbo lag? Does does that come into play when you've got not an on a big lot that's longer <laughs> than than the other one? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, I would have to have mirror image turbos if I was going to go that way. Well, good. I want to see that happen. I, All right, guys, I got to get going. Think about. All right, Rich. Thanks again. Thanks Please. for having nice me, guys. Awesome. You. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Anytime, man. Talk to you guys later. That's okay. Cool. All right. I got I got to start watching some of his videos. Yeah, yeah. I watched as I was coming back from Tennessee tonight. I kind of had the, uh, which is the best small block. He took a Windsor, three fifty one Windsor, uh, three fifty Chevy Vortec, and a three sixty Magnum, and and dynoed them and and. Uh, yeah, interesting, somewhat, but. Uh, Said that the, the cubic inch motor made the most power, and in the basic theory, you know, no replacement for displacement. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, he uh, they po I, I I caught him a couple weeks back, and on one of the videos they did about a four sixty versus a four fifty five or four fifty four, and we wa and I watched it, and I was like. Okay, the intake he put on that Ford is not one that I would have used. He he used a better intake on the Chevy, and a couple pieces. And I was like, eh, that, it wasn't it wasn't an apples to apples comparison. I get what he was trying to say. A motor on the four hundred and sixty inch range is going to make power, whether it's a Chrysler, a Ford, GM, and, and I get that, but there was some variables that just out of it. You know, I, I get what he was trying to do, but it's, you know, you know, and, and, and understanding what he's, I mean, I understand what he's doing, but you know, some of the engine builders I've talked with and like, but like he just said, he's not an engine builder and I get what he's doing. And I, you know, I can appreciate what he's doing. Um, you know, putting some data out there. It's, no, they they took the 460 once he was done with it. Got a set of uh, I think they were P51 Kazi heads, uh, and stroked and boarded out to a 557. And the piston choice wasn't exactly right, and they ended up with like a nine eight to one compression ratio in a 500 inch motor, and it didn't make near the power that it should have. And it's like, yeah, because the compression on that motor should have been about. 11 to 12 and he'd have, he'd have easily made a thousand horsepower normally aspirated and he you know and he even had in the thing he says tell me what i did wrong and i was all the guys that i know said the same thing the compression wasn't even near right he could have run could have run a lot more camshaft you know because i i got a buddy of mine that's got the first set of uh kazi p51 heads that were ever made and uh you know he runs he used to run the engine master's you know, with the uh, couple other guys. So, well, I'll, I'll ask around, see if I can't find the heads he's looking for. You never know. Mm. Cool. So, I know we got Brian building these super high tech blow through Ford carburetors now. He's, he's, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to take your place, Ray. Uh, I you? just, I just walked in and this poor kid, I mean, looking like, I don't even know what this is. <laughs> oh, really? So it was it was his it's his own car? No, it was a customer that brought a car in and it, you know, it had been sitting for a while and no acceleration and you know, they just start you know, they have no idea, you know, so we looked down and there was no squirty squirty when you gave it acceleration. So oh, big was, giant this, hole. This was an independent shop, not a not Yeah. A, right, okay. Yeah. So and, why, you, actually, you actually got into doing that right there at, at his place? Yeah, yeah. We uh we just I said let's uh let's pop this thing off and let's start taking I, it apart. So talk about I, full I, service, I, man. 
I, I can't keep I can't just say no and walk away. I I gotta get my hands dirty so and smell like <laughs> old gas. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. that's great. Oh uh, nothing worse so, than that turpentine yeah. smelling <laughs> yeah. gas. Oh, that's good. But yeah, I, 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 you know, the ethanol, the ethanol killed that carburetor. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just, uh, and uh, they had put a, they had put a gas tank in, and I said you should take, uh, get one of those little, uh, you know, plastic or just uh, inline filter, just to, because you're going to be cleaning so much stuff out of there. You, you know, it's just so right. much stuff. That's still in the regular lines and all that stuff, you know. It's just going. It's and it all ends up in the carburetor. So I you mean, said they, yeah. they changed the they diagnosed it as, and changed the coil first, which was wrong. Yeah, they had. Well, they started putting all kinds of uh, parts on. You know. Yep. yep. When in and doubt, throw parts at it. Throw yeah. Parts, well, throw parts at it. That's it. When uh, you know, like I said, it's not. It's nothing bad. It's just you know, like I said, you just. Yeah, it just wasn't right. You know. Yeah. I mean, Hey, you figure a guy who's in a shop, an automotive shop, doing work should be able to diagnose something like that a little, a little better than just. Yeah, by... but when the car is older than than everybody in the yeah. shop, it's you know. And then Brian, the two man no walks excuse. in. And Mac uh, and the two man walks in. Nah, come on. Nah, man. Nah, nah. Nah. Well, like I said, <laughs> it just gives you a little more, a little more shop cred, man. Yeah, you know, you nah, just, just, yeah. you know yeah, like yeah. I said, I, I would walk in. Your leotards and your cape. Yeah, it, it's it's bad enough when you walk in and somebody puts a smoke machine on a car with a carburetor and wonder why smoke comes out. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you're, I'm looking for a vacuum leak. I said, yeah, you found one hell of a vacuum yeah, leak. It's so, right I mean, top of the engine. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a controlled vacuum leak. Exactly. Yeah, so, you know, like I said, I mean, it's great when you have modern technology and tools, but, you, you know, you got to know where you're – what you can get away with, I guess. I don't know. You know, and that's, that's so funny because we've come that far and the, you know, the, 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 the generations of people who are doing it are so much younger now. Like we used to be the, the, the front line and now we're not. So now it's just a whole new set of problems, a whole new set of um, incongruities that's in place that didn't exist. Ooh. That's, that's the word of the day. Incongruity. Go, right. <laughs> no. yeah. Gotta keep that's up with so you guys. No, no, so, no, so, no. That, so Ray, that was, yo, spell that one out. <laughs> no, that one before, I don't remember what it was, but so, so Ray, are any of the diners up there open, or they still got it all, everything on lockdown? Oh, no, everything's open. Yeah, everything's been open for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, what wasn't open was I have, I have an Arby's by me, and up to about a couple months ago, you still couldn't sit in the Arby's and eat. You had to just take take out only. I was like, what the hell's that all about? But now I yeah, saw they don't even. Yeah, they I were like the last holdout. I still well, say that what? place that I sent you has got your name written all over. Yeah. Oh, the house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was that. That was a. That was a. That guy. That did was the, a nice. That was a nice shop and a house on twenty acres for very nice, decent money. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. I agree. Yeah, I gotta. I gotta go get the crank tomorrow. The the, the machine shop called me and said she's all cut and balanced and ready to go. So I'll go get the the the, the block. Uh, go get the crank and then. Maybe I might run it to the engine builder this weekend and take him to carburetor and some other stuff. All I right. did. Get, I did get my Thompson performance uh, squirter or uh, the plates oh, for my dominator. So we'll I see how those, those work. I have those in both of my my carburetors. I put those in both of the carburetors. And uh, yeah, yeah, nice. They, they took because when I contacted them, told them what I had, they said take a picture of the throat of the carburetor. So I did, and they said okay. You need this this kit, so I ordered the kit, and two or three days later, I got them. And that's do I, did I send you the picture with the cat laying on the using the carburetor yeah. for the? I was I I had the carburetor on the table, and I was putting the the the, the thing on there, and the cat crawled up and used a dominator like it was a pillow. Nice. And I was like, really? Nice. It's nice. like, good lord, cat. And on that note, I must be heading off because, like I said, I got a lot of crap to take care of in the morning. Oh, let me tell you a funny music story first. Oh, please. When I just got to backdate this. When my kids were little, we used to go to my friend's block party all the time in East Meadow. And okay. they always had the same DJ every year. And he would always do this name that tune thing. And, and I, you know, he wasn't fooling me. So I would, like, feed my daughter the answer. She'd run over there and, oh, yeah. And, and you know, she was, after about five or six songs, 
that nobody else was getting, you know, he's like, all right. He said, what's your name? And she's like, oh, Lauren. You know, she was like, you know, I don't know, 12, 10, 12 years old. Now she's 31, but you know, she was little. He goes, Lauren, where's your dad? She goes, Lauren's dad. I want Lauren's dad to stand up. So, you know, cross the street, four blocks up. I stand up. You know, all right. We got to suspect you can't play anymore. So I'm like, all right. So this has been an ongoing thing all these years. And uh, now she just sent me a text before. She's down in North Carolina. She's down in, in uh, Charlotte. She went down for a Jets game, of all things. See, the Jets and the uh, the Panthers play like a pre preseason game. Jets, Jets, Jets. Yeah, yeah. But they were at a bar. They were at a sports bar tonight. And they, they, were, they had something to eat and they're drinking. And she was, Dad, you'll never believe it. I'm down here. And, and, the, and the, you know, it's a hopping crowd. The DJ does this, like, name that tune thing. And nobody knows the song. So I should be, and she knew, like, it, it was – um cherry bomb she goes joan jet <laughs> and the guy says wow he goes how do you That's know the that? runaways Where are wow. you from? <laughs> uh, from new york he says oh it figures so she goes i won name that too I'm like great excellent <laughs> so the we're just rolling it on joan jet. No, no keep on passing it through keep on passing it through my it's little boy he's learning about earth wind and fire guns nice. and wars, and he's learning about all of them you know you know what's it called blue oyster cult he's learned about them all you know police you know because yeah. first he's got to learn how to play. Well, first he listens, and now he's got to play it. Right, right. You know what? I had, what? No I had sly drinks. in the family stone. Oh, totally, sly totally, sly totally. Great. You need making. You need making George's little Richard. You need Augusta George's, uh, he, the hardest working man in show business. James he is, Brown. He, he is. He is very versed in all of them. You know, very versed. You know. I tell you what, Terry. I was a couple months back. I was talking with this young fella, and he was a. A, a, a young black man and I was talking to him about music and, and this, that, and the other. And I said something about James Brown and this, that, and the other. And he says, James who? Oh, oh and man. I was like, you walk you away. don't know who James Brown is. And he's yeah. like, and I was like, be still my heart. You don't know who my James Brown is, is. The hardest working man in show business. Sure. Make it funky. It's like, I, I yeah, felt sorry yeah, for him. Make it I, funky. I felt sorry for him that he didn't know who James Brown was. And I was just like, that's like, like when that's like when you go to the auto parts store, like John was saying, you know, like, and you tell them about the part, and you tell them that it's a, a Chevelle, and they ask what who what make is it? Yeah, who makes? You it? walk out. You right. walk out. You know. Yeah. It was it, it was funny because I needed an alternator belt for my uh, tool truck. You know, when the alternator went up, and I go into the auto parts store and I said, "Hey, here's the belt number." But, you know, I got a little bit of room to play. So if you got, you know, this number or this number, and he goes, well, how do you know that? <laughs> and I said, well, this is the measurement of the belt. Right. So I have some play. So, like I said, if you have a number, you know, with a five or a three or what, you know. Number the bridge and then the end is usually like the inches, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, and he's like, he walks back and he comes back with these belts about, you know, two and a half feet too long. And I said, no, 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 look at the number. I was like, never mind. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's I, when they say, I, I, that's when that's when they tell you to go in the back. Okay, here's the yeah. belt. <laughs> yeah, I, I did that. I did that one time with one of the belts off the 15 liter. That guy, I, I I wrote the number down. I said, "Here's the number." I said, "Here's the belt." And I said, "The guy comes back with a real puzzled look on his face, and he goes, I, I, is this it?'" And he held it up, and I was like, "Yeah, that's it." And he goes, "Well, this is twice as big as the one that you had." And I went. Yeah, I know the pulley cocked and it shoved, so it, it ate half of the belt because it's like a <laughs> ten, it's a ten rib belt. So there was only about five or six ribs left. So he's like, uh, "I said, yeah, that's it. It's a, it's, it's a big ten rib belt." I said, "That's the right one." Yeah, that's the right one. He's like, "Is this it?" Oh, Hold it up, and it's like, "Yeah." It's like, "Yeah, this one is wow. emergency spare only." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was crazy. I tell you, because that's the, the Cummins is bad about that. It won't kill the belt; it kills the tensioner. And then it just shoves the belt into the motor, and then it just yeah. just eats the belt. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Wow. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to head off. Oh, don't forget, this Monday is the night. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but waiting. Right. This Monday. This Monday, this Monday is the night, 10 o'clock. We'll be watching. 10 o'clock, Discovery. You'll see your boy sitting out there making a television debut, making a fool of himself all across America. Well, we'll watching, Terry, man. I'll have to DVR it because – 10 o'clock Monday night, I will be in Louisville, Kentucky, making well, a delivery they, for Well, they're doing a the morning on at 2 o'clock in the morning, so you you might be able to catch it. Well, I'll be asleep. 
Yeah. I'll be at a truck stop and sleep somewhere because I have to make a delivery at eight o'clock mark next morning. I got DVR. Vince, take one for the team, buddy. You'll stay up. Take one I got, for the team. I don't have cable in my truck. Yeah. I don't have that big money like I don't have that big money like you YouTube you YouTube stars. I know what yeah. you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. Broke over here. <laughs> but you know hey, that's, 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 nice that's why everyone. I'm driving an 06 with a million miles on it. Oh, yeah. I got a 67 with a million miles on it. But anyways. And, John, you might like this. I'm thinking about 427 on this one. Good man. This, But it's going to be an LS 427. That's okay. Yeah. I'll That's make okay. you happy. I'm, uh, I heard that, Brian. There's <laughs> a very good chance that this car is getting a, a, a hooker LS swap transmission cross member. Welcome to the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> It's a nice design. It's got big humps so you can run in large exhaust, and it's kind of universal. So, hey, Terry, uh, I may wind up using that. What's up, Vince? John Wick didn't kill all those people for a Camaro. <laughs> this conversation's <laughs> over. <laughs> this conversation's over. <laughs> See you later. Take care. Be easy, everyone. Brian Nutter in the in the room. My man Mike in the room. DF Beagle. What's up? Yo, Mike Spiegel. Yo, I will talk to you guys later. Be Tour, easy, everyone. Take care. All yeah. right. Dude, Wait on. Uh, Unbelievable. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Wowza. Keep working at it. Make that Cletus McFarlane money. Yeah, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's what you gotta do. Brian, you're all fuzzy tonight. What happened? You got like Vaseline on your camera? No. Nah. Yeah, it's kind of looking like six forty. Uh, yeah, you're real fuzzy. Hurts. It's like really, it looks yeah. real clear on my end. I yeah, don't know. Terrible on our end. It's bad resolution. Looks like, it looks like uh, gauze paper on a. On right. The yeah. Yeah, Ray. Huh. I'll let you know. I, I've got I've got a new computer. Okay. And I actually, but there's no. It doesn't have a camera or any of that stuff on it. So. I, I guess I'll have to like run the Best Buy. Go buy, go to let, get a Logitech, and it just hangs right on it. Well, right. I, I had one, and then my wife took it because the wife works at home now because of all this stuff, and she does a lot of the video conferences with because she, the the construction crew she works with. So I just gave it to her. I said, "Here, you you use it all the time." So I'm I got to go to Best Buy because my brand new computer will not talk to my printer. Oh wow! I can scan. I can scan. That's weird, but I can't print. And I'm like, I need the printer more than I need the scanner. Are you trying? Are you are you hooked up with a wire? Or are you doing it wirelessly? Well, the, it's a, it's an older Canon, um, and like I said, I can wire it. I can wire it, and uh, it it comes in. It's like a printer something something, and it will scan, but it will not print. And I'm like, we do downloaded the new drivers. We spent two hours this thing and it just it will not print it'll scan beautiful but i need a printer more than i need a scanner right so i guess i'm gonna have to break down and go buy a printer because i mean hell this this printer is about eight or nine years old works great There's your problem. it's just it won't this this new computer it just will not work i downloaded every driver you can download and it just won't work did you contact Canon? Well, Canon says that printer was oh, that we you know we stopped making that printer model in uh, like 2007, and I was like, or whatever it was, whatever year it was, and there's like, yeah, you know, down not supporting it anymore. Yeah, so it's that's basically what they said is just go buy another printer, and I'm like, well, I got a closet full of ink for this one. <laughs> you know, and that's a disposable world. Just just yeah. don't fix it. Just go buy another one. Repair by replacement. Yeah, that's the way it is these days. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to. I remember I, Ray. I was, I was talking to you about that 4.2 liter in my son's car. Right. Um, that thing still. The thing runs great. If you do any kind of idling once it's warmed up to temperature and you run it for like more than like 20, 30 minutes, check engine light, check engine light, cam sensor, cam sensor, uh, crank sensor, crank. Se and it keeps it's a, like a P O O 14 code and you look it up and they all kind of point back to the VVT's my, or the, the VVT yeah. um, thing. And I'm just like, I guess I'm going to have to break down and put a, put one of those. Uh, it's not a sensor. What the hell they call that thing? Not, is it a module or 
the solenoids. The v- v- uh, yeah, that's right. The VVT solenoid. What weight oil is he running? That's all I was just going to oh. ask. Like, we we were talking about five, oil I, before. We put five thirty in it. I mean, that's what it's. It's 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 a uh, it's the fourth two. It's a GMC Envoy, so it's got the four two. Uh, Vortec or 4200 Vortec, I think is what they call it. It's the inline six thing is really snappy. I mean, when, when the check engine lights off and it, 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 the thing to me reminds me of like a, a diesel, as soon as that check engine light, it's like it derates because as soon as that damn check engine light comes on, it's immediately, I can tell the difference in the way the thing runs and the way it reacts. And in a diesel, same thing. When you get the check engine on a diesel, normally it's already derated and then it kicks the light on. So, I, like I said, it keeps giving that P0014, and they just, it could be this, yeah. could be that, could be this. I replaced the cam sensor just because it was weeping. You know, it was a lot of oil sitting around it, and, and I pulled it out, and, and and the damn little blue O-ring was flat on one side. And I went, well, there's part of the problem there. So, I was like, well, that's 20 bucks. So, I just, you know, went ahead and replaced it, cleared the codes, and it ran good, you know, same thing about an hour later. Boom, check engine lights on again, P0014. I'm like, oh, I guess I might as well just change that VVT solenoid and just see if that fixes it. Better check they, the wiring harness. Check the connection. They, 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 the, when I pulled the, co- or the, the three or four codes that it says could be this, could be that, could be this, could be this, they all basically end up pointing back to the VVT solenoid. Brian, is this scan data that would support that? In live data mode, uh, if I'm not mistaken, yes. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not familiar. With, I'm not super familiar with that, I, but I, I just. Thinking, yeah, if you could read the live data, I mean, usually you, what you're usually doing is reading fuel trims and you, and and like your O2 sensors. That's usually what you read with stuff like that. But you'd want to read direct data for the the VD3 system. But you have to have yeah. a scanner that does that. Yeah, because what 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 it's what it's telling me is that the uh, camshaft. Um, what, what is it? It said the camshaft timing is it's, it's saying that there's an error in the camshaft timing. Or I, I don't know about the mileage, but unless your chain is stretched, because I know that's another problem. The chain stretches on them and you're not going to have. I read my mind, man. <laughs> well, I'm just going by what I see in other shops. And, yeah. Um, what guys go down. Basic mechanic. And that's that would change that. That would change the the. The rate uh, of turn of the of the cam gear. If yeah, the I mean the I, I got you know like I said on some of those and I know it's common. Uh, there's like I said is uh, the sprockets and chains wear, and uh, once that happens, I mean yeah, then your then your timing is just going to just fluctuate. Yeah, just because well, you just because your mechanical tolerances are all sudden there. What, what about putting a timing light on it and look at the you know look at the mark and watch it and see if it see if what, it's jumping what, around. It fluctuates, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, go uh, old school on that. Yeah, quick and easy. Well, I mean, this way it's not intrusive. You're not taking anything apart just for shits and giggles. I mean, well, this way if you see something, you can go further. Well, the thing is, they the, the, the people who had it before him or before I found it. They weren't, you could tell they weren't that religious with the oil changes. Right. And not that they were bad, but I've seen some things that they definitely weren't Johnny on the spot with it. And and that's one of the things is I, I might just go ahead and just pull the sensor out just to look at it and to they see if it is. Because, I mean, it's all very uh, finicky with the oil. The oil passages are very small. And yeah. And really- I- they need clean yeah. oil all the time. Yeah, and, and and the thing is, it's all you do is basically to get it out is you just drop the belt, and there's three bolts on the power steering, and boom. So, I mean, you can literally, if you've got the tools and the motor's not blazing hot, you can have the thing out and, you know, knock on wood, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Well, you can always make Four. his day and build him the third Mercury. He's not. My son like Lou and I have had many conversations that to him is transportation from here to A to A to B. That's it. We'll put an LS in it for him. Well, <laughs> I'd put a Windsor in it before I put an yeah, LS I know in you it. Would. I only said that because you can't reach me through the screen. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Vince. I'll take, I'll take the convertible with a 390 in it. Four speed, yeah. right? 
Uh, well, I well, see. That's the thing is, I've got the I've got the motor, because I, I bought the car as a roller, and Ray and I have discussed. You know, Brian, you know as well as I do. If you say top loader four speed, especially for a big block, they want a thousand dollars for transmission. And speaking of roller, we've talked about April Wine too. She's a roller. That's right. That's a great. That's a great tune. It is. I went and bought. I bought it on vinyl. Brian, I don't know, man. A convertible with you, your hair get all messed up. You're gonna have to. Ah, like, man, I want. I miss my convertible. You're gonna have you to. Have to fight, you'd have to fight the wife for the convertible because that's. She keeps telling me that's her car. Wow, and, she, uh, hey, Vince, convertible. Jeez. I I, I tell oh, you, I I kick myself every time you come up in conversation. Because when I walked away from that 66 Cyclone convertible with a 289 Hypo four-speed car, wow. and I walked away from that, I kicked myself that I didn't bring that thing home. Why did you walk, Brian? Because my father thought I was crazy because a tree was growing out of the center of it. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I remember that story. Okay. Well, you didn't walk. You were you were dragged. Yeah. But I to this day, I still yeah. – that would have been uh, – like I said, I I, 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 I got one myself. for you, Brian. When I was probably a, a wee lad, and I think my dad was DOD civil service, and my dad's originally originally from Richmond, Michigan, which is just outside of Detroit, and he was living in Savannah, Georgia, and Hunter Army Airfield closed, so being DOD and all that, you know he found out that Selfridge field in Michigan had an opening. So he transferred to Selfridge field. He worked up there for X number, X number of years. And we had a 66 Fairlane convertible that had been in the family since 68. He bought it in 68 in Savannah and had it with us. And he also, he also had a 67 Newport, 383 two door hard top wow. and he found a 66 or 67 i don't remember exactly what year it was fairlane had a hypo 289 and a four speed the guy had gone through and put four buckets in it and was just really tricking us now this is back in the set this is back in the 70s when Hunter opened back up in Savannah. My dad said, screw this. I've, I'm from Michigan. I had enough snow. I'm going back south. He left that fair lane there and basically called the junk man, come get it. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, he, the days. he goes, he goes, I had my mom drove. Um, my mom drove the U-Haul back from Michigan. Um, my dad drove like the convertible back. And then I forget how they got to Chrysler back, but, you know, they freight trained, you know, cars and truck. I think mm. one of my uncles or somebody drove one of their cars back and he goes, I couldn't take it with me. He goes, he goes, I kick to this day. He says he swapped the trunks on it and then called the junk man to come get it. He goes, I can't take it to Georgia with me. So he goes, come get it. So He's in it. Of, I ran out of people, ran out of drivers. Yeah. yeah. Now that, that was one of them. And I went and looked at a uh, uh, 68 AMX with a drag pack, 390 four-speed car. Nice. And we went out. It was out in some trailer park down in Virginia. My old man had a fit. We come in there, and this dude was was a big guy, tattooed. It had it had the long gorilla hair glued to the to the ceiling of the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And. Uh, this guy opens the door and says, yeah, this car's got to go. It's got to go. Uh, I need the money. It's got to go. And my dad asked why. He goes, yeah, because I'm, I'm going to the state pen for 10 <laughs> years. And my dad said, get back, get back in the car, boy. And then we <laughs> got back in the car. And then we drove down. One time we drove all the way down in Virginia. And it was a 65 Shelby GT350 original car. And this guy had it sitting outside. He had just moved into a townhouse and it was sitting outside just getting, somebody came by and stole all the wheels off of it. 
and it was sitting there and the, and I show up. My dad said, it doesn't even have fucking wheels on it. I don't <laughs> understand why you don't understand. I want you to have something to drive. Yeah. And I said, dad, this is, I, we got to get this car. We're taking this car home. And he goes, there's no way. So 30 years later, we're watching Barrett Jackson. And here Bang. comes a 65 Shelby rolling across the screen. My dad looked at me and I said, don't say a fucking word. Yeah. <laughs> you should have learned to bring your mom with you to buy cars, not your mom. <laughs> yeah, no. What would happen if you wanted to buy, buy the Kennedy limo? But uh, yeah. well, I, well, it was so funny because we get back in the car and we're driving back. And, of course, we're crammed in a, a, a 79 Volkswagen Rabbit diesel, you know. And me and my dad, both big guys, were cruising along. And he goes, son, I don't understand why you don't understand that I want you to have a car that you could drive, not something that you had to rebuild, you know? But, man, right. so those speaking, are the three. Speaking of rebuilding, John, besides your bumper looking really sharp, your rear end looks really nice tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting ready to uh, start doing the final welding. I got a nice. – I got to massage the braces. There's a runs from the middle of the housing uh -huh. out out to where the housing ends are. Yeah. So I got to I got to lop off the ends, make sure they're square, fit that brace, and then put the jig bar through it and weld it all up. <laughs> Whose sheet metal are you using, John? That one is I don't know who makes them, but ART Applied Racing Technology sells them. Well, another sheet metal. Oh, well, on the car? Right. It's from uh, Goodmark. Goodmark, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah see, I... Goodmark. Some of the stuff that, that they are finally doing for our... For for the... For my beastly is uh, AMD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've heard a lot of good... A lot of good things said that it's... The stampings are really, really... You know, really close to the... Uh, you know, same gauge... You know, yeah. four. You know, damn near looked like four dies. So, I'll tell you, a friend of mine is rebuilding his GTX with all AMD stuff, and it's it is very very nice. Yeah. And yeah, I so put a good mark fender on my car, and that was very very nice. So, yeah, I don't yeah, think see, AMD that's... makes Firebird quarter panels. Yeah. Well, see, that's like me. I, you know, my dad has the '69 Chevelle that I drove to high school, and he has told me that. You know, I'll, I'll get that car back eventually. Well, he took the Super Sport hood off of it that I had on it and put a fiberglass cowl hood on it. And I'm like, I'm putting a steel Super, uh, super Sport hood back on that thing. If you can find uh, Well, it's, I can't remember if Goodmark or who, may, who. Somebody makes them. Hell, I went by, I, I did the delivery the other day and I went right by year one and, um, Oh, what you call it? It's the same town that uh, Road Atlanta's in. Huh. Oh, what the hell's the name of that? Uh, oh, see, now it's, it's oh, B. I it starts with I a B. I stayed at a, at a really super expensive hotel by Road Atlanta. Like, right down the <laughs> block, as a matter of fact. Well, I... It was weird. Brazelton. When we, went, when we went to pick this car up, <laughs> When we went to go pick this car up, Evan Smith says, dude, you got to stay at this place. It's beautiful. There's a golf course. The restaurant's phenomenal. Great bar, the whole nine yards. He goes, and it's literally right down the block from Road Atlanta. And I'm like, okay. So I give Barb the name. She makes the reservations. $420 for one night. <laughs> mm. Didn't know that until after I checked out <laughs> without without a complimentary drink yeah unbelievable yeah, place was gorgeous though yeah better be it's called it's called brazelton george is where it's at okay okay and basically when i when i made that delivery the other day if you, as you get off the interstate if you go from where i was coming if you go right you go to road atlanta <laughs> turn left and you go drive right by year one there's a oh, big industrial yeah. complex right down the street Nice, cool. Yeah, because I know uh, Chip Foose used to come up there, uh, and in Brazelton and and do that when they'd have a uh, because they were, I forget what they called it, 
they were uh, they're uh, supporting uh, Frigeria, and that's one of his. He had a sibling that had Frigeria, so that would he'd always come up there, and whenever they would do that year one gala, and he would always be there for a, I think a day or two. And uh, I I hadn't seen if if they were doing that recently with all all the, the China flu and everything. And uh, 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 John, uh, yeah, China. China. You staying out of Facebook jail? I just got um, permission from those ass hats to go live. No, oh. I was I was on a thirty day couldn't post a forty day can't go live or advertise. Uh, so now I got I got that back. Thank you, Zucker ass. So nice of them. Yeah. And uh, like I would even spend the first nickel to advertise with them. But I am shadow banned. I could make six posts and you'll see two. Yeah. And it's it's always the ones that are controversial that for some reason nobody sees them for days. Yeah. yeah. And then, then like five days later I start getting comments. Yeah. And I'm like, you're just seeing that now? Yeah. So yeah, uh, I've I have i have had a couple like that that I, I made some posts and I was like, I'd ask the wife, I said, do me a favor. Um, see if you can see this post because you know, same thing. You'd make the post and you put it out there and it's like just crickets. And I'm like, and she would check and she go, Yeah, she goes, It it comes right up. And I was like, Oh, okay, I just it depends I on had your made keywords a, that are in it. <laughs> I, I had made a post one time about what we were doing something. We were at Target and we walked by the book section or something. We were doing something. And I looked over and they had one of, you know, oh, oh, dumbasses books sitting there. And I just, I, she's like, what are you doing? And I said, I just, I need to see something. I flipped it open and you talk about a condescending, just self absorbed, you know what, waffle. Asshole. Um, he wrote his own forward to his own book. <laughs> really? Oh, really? Really? Yeah. That's like, uh, remove, you know, you know, cranial from rectal. Um, it, yeah. you're just so self-absorbed. I did it, but it just, I just, I, I had to laugh and my wife's like, what do you do? And I, and I showed her, I said, this ass hat wrote his own forward to his own book. I said, that's, I said, that tells me that he either didn't A, write this book, which he probably didn't. No. You know, I, I don't think he's. And that was the thing with, with, you know, when he came to prominence, people, I had people go, oh, you don't like him because he's black. I went, color's got nothing to do with it. I went to school with white kids and black kids and Chinese kids and Japanese kids and Jamaican kids. I could care less what color your skin is. I really could. I look at what you do and what you say. And if you're, if you're, if you're, what you say matches your actions, that's what I've always yeah. looked at. And, um, he basically was just, you know, a jag off, you know, we, you know, if you look at his record when he was in the, you know, in the state Senate, he voted present like 99.8% of the time. Not yes, not no present. Really? You know, same thing. He was in the Senate, you know, got sworn into the Senate and was there for six months. And same thing, voted on three or four bills and then immediately started campaigning and fundraising for presidency, you yeah. know, president. Yeah. He's the true Manchurian candidate. Yeah. yeah, he set the man who set race relations back 50 years. An asshole. I just, uh, like I said, I just, uh, you know. But you know what? I'll tell you what, he set race relations back 50 years. He started the divide in his country. I'll take his asinine moves over the <laughs> douchebag that's in office today. Well, well, he's just a, the one who's there now is just a racist. He's he's not calling the shots. They're calling he's the a, forum. He's a, yeah, he's a maniac, and he's just set this country up for another 9-11. Yeah. He's, he's just a... He's just a, a northeastern racist from way back when. John, I'm I'm with you. I'm really kind of 
It's going to happen. Worried about yeah. You got a wide open border that I hear it almost on a daily basis. The border patrol is saying, "I got people coming in here that I can't vouch for." Right. And and your policy is letting them go. Yeah. And, well, and it, what's it, to stop? What's to stop some Middle Eastern guys from working their way to Central America and coming through? John, it's already Nothing. happening. It's already happening. Yeah, We're already been, placing they, them all over the place. They, yep. John, they have they have a category OTM when they catch them. You know, other than Mexican, and they said they've they've they they're catching people that are on the terrorist watch lists, and yep. I mean. And the thing that just really chapped my butt with this Afghanistan deal was they kept talking about, oh, we've pulled out 120,000 people. Okay, well, Most how many Americans, Afghanis. how yeah. many American citizens should have been first on the list? And then the Afghanis who helped and aided the Americans should have been following them. And then the military, after you pulled out all of the equipment, and then, you know, drop the Moab or two as you were leaving. Oh, boy. A lot of you know, people said that and it never happened. Right. You know, right. we're not we're not leaving anything for you. Here's a bomb. Bye boy. Yeah. Supposedly. They uh, made all of the sophisticated equipment there unusable before they left. Well, that that's the stuff that they left it to. That's the stuff they left at the airbase. That's not the stuff that the Taliban or not the uh, Afghan army had. Right. See, I look at it as they've got all that uh, all that lithium there that they're gonna mine. That's, that's why China, China's moving in. China's moving in, and who's the best reverse engineers in the world? Yeah. China. Chinese. All they gotta All yeah. they gotta do is grab a Black Hawk. They'll figure out how to make that thing work in six months. Just leave them a couple of circuit boards. They'll figure out what they did. Yeah. That was well, a, that's like, the, the well, that's dumbest like move. In, unless unless there's some sort of conspiracy and, and the press is really, really not telling us even a tenth of what's going on. Common sense tells you that that was the worst way to pull out of that place that could ever be imagined. Well, it's you just, like you don't uh, do it. it's like if you know who Jocko Wilnick is, uh, former SEAL, former instructor, and all that. He goes, he goes. When we were over there, he says we owned the night. He says because our NVG stuff was so good. He goes, they just sit in their caves. They knew better than to stick their head out because we would just pop just like a freaking rabbit in the field, you know. And they learned that the night was uh, the Americans owned the night. Well, now, you know, they all of this equipment. stuff. That, yeah, now now they're they're uh, the Taliban or whatever it is, however they like to pronounce it. Um, I'm like Stephen Crowder. I'm not going to go the Taliban. I'm not going to give them their thing. I, it's, you know, uh, I, no. that oh, it amazes me that that Biden says those words exactly like the douchebag he used to work for. Yeah. Or, or the, what was it? The other one, the Pakistanis, the yeah, Taliban. Yeah, yeah. Like I've been Ali, hearing from I've been hearing some woman. All of that, and I'm like, what's with you? Yeah, You're I'm not American some, if you know, speak that way. I've been hearing some woman on Fox because I, you know, my back is always to the TV in the kitchen, and I hear her saying Afghanistan, and I want to turn around and say, who the oh, hell, like, who that's the hell the one is that? From, that's the one from Europe. Okay, that's the car. That's the correspondent from Europe. What the hell's that? Oh. She's an older well, I, woman. That's a that's their their. European correspondent, and okay. she speaks with that English yeah. hard uh, 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 kind of, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, almost like German. But yeah, he he talks about that stuff, and he and he enunciates the names of these jerk offs the same way that that the former president did. And I'm like, the, neither the only of you were American if you speak that yeah. way. Yeah, the only one that I ever. I got any of appreciation out of was 41 when he used to call him Saddam. Yeah. Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Yeah. Saddam yeah, yeah, Hussein. yeah, yeah. And everybody, that just, everybody goes, that just told me he was hardcore Texan. Right. Well, right. believe it or not, he did that on purpose because yeah, piss him off. Pr- pronouncing it Saddam 
like that was an insult, basically giving him the old, you know, uh, you know. Yeah. And he goes, that's why 41 did it that way. Is he goes, you know, instead of Sodom, he goes, no, he'd call him Saddam. He, and he says, oh, no, it's a direct, um, you know, right there to you. <laughs> That's so funny. And, and, you know, not, you know, you know, and that's, that was the thing is I, I was never a big fan of the Bushies. Hell, Bush 41 is the one who coined the term voodoo economics. Yeah. You know, so he was, you know, uh, I, having a son a conversation with my son a while back and they were asking, well, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? I said, I'm a conservative. I said, I pay enough taxes for, you know, you and me both. And uh, so the party that closely, the closest aligns is the Republican Party. And I said, even them, you got so many that are just freaking rhinos, Republican in name only. Um, Mitch McConnell has got to go. He is worthless as tits on a boar hog. He is an absolute disaster as in the Senate. He's a deal maker. That's all he wants to do is make deals. Well, he's that's looking out for number one as BTO would like to say. Um, but that's not the thing, to, you know, it's not the looking out for America. It's looking out for Mitch McConnell, which if they're wanting to investigate people, you know, why, why don't they look at his wife who is in bed with the Chinese government? They or actually, go. technically, it's his wife's family that's in bed with the Chinese government. And, and just, there's, like you said, John, there's so many of them that just need to go. They all need to go. I don't give a they shit who do. they are. Every last one of them. What, what was that? What was that? I love that line from the, the the Batman movie. This town needs an Emma. Yeah. Enema? Yeah, it does. DC needs a big Enema. Huge Enema. Get rid of... K I, I just get really pissed off when I read stuff about how, how China owns Smithfield Pork, which is the largest pork producing corporation in America. And Smithfield owns like 40 million acres of farm land. So well, you, now you, John, China owns 40 million acres of farmland in my country. They own John, AMC you, theaters. So every time you walk in AMC theater to go buy a, to go see a movie, you're sending your money to the commies. John, now you do is, realize there's only there's only four. Uh, per, for what is it package house pack, packaging houses yeah you know big is it's like the one guy uh, like they were saying you know the farmer's not making money when he sells steers and and hogs here not making any money the uh what was it that one ass and i come out there and said if you take out the price of pork uh beef and chicken uh prices are in line for uh what's going on and they're like really inflation's up what seven eight percent and if you take out the price of pork and beef and chicken well yeah that's the biggest you know i, I don't know it's i'm just i'm wondering when people are just going to stand up and quit being sheep after next week after this weekend telling you it's gonna happen mark my words you're gonna watch the news on 9 11 and you're gonna see something that you didn't think you'd ever see and I it's gonna not. come it's gonna come from the place we just vacated yeah but they're gonna have a big party saying that we beat the americans just like we well, beat the russians they're making their <laughs> formal announcements as to their government which the Minister of the Interior is somebody the FBI has a $10 million bounty on as a terrorist. But that's not what I'm talking about. We got Americans over there that can't get out. There's too many Americans that can't get out. And it's going to be gonna nasty. Wind, you're going to wind up with, with somebody's going to become a martyr. And that martyr is going to be an American. And that means we're going to have to go back in there. And if this person oh, the, uh, doesn't go back in there hard... He's gonna. This country's gonna flip upside down, and they'll they'll take him out on a pole. They uh. Well, one, you one hell of the guys. A lot more Americans than you have military in Washington D.C. They'll 
the crazy people that own this country, us, they're going to run that that place over. You're going to putting the fence. This. They're putting the fence back up around the, the fence Capitol. Back up, yeah, because of that uh, thing they're going to have. Well, one of, one of I the... swear to God, man, I'm I'm waiting for it to happen. It's going to be a fucking disaster here. And I really well, think it's going to happen this weekend. Well, John, you know that old saying, where do you put your money? Bacon and bullets? Yeah. Yeah, I hope not. Me too. I hope not too. It's just ridiculous. I just, I don't know. Like the the, the one guy, uh, I heard a thing the other day, or was it yesterday? It was yesterday. Uh, one of the guys who were the survivors of the Benghazi attack, they asked yeah. him, they said, how much of this is similar to what you saw when all that crap happened in Benghazi? He goes, oh, it's play by play. A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. He goes, it's all unfolding exactly like it was. And he goes, he goes, he goes, and then the guy goes, well, do you think they're going to have to be over there within like, uh, six months to a year, whatever? And he goes, we'll be back over there within 30 to 45 days max. He goes, we'll be back over there. And the guy's like, you're serious. He goes, 30 to 45 days. We'll be back over there because it's going to turn into a Charlie Fox trot. It's, I'm not happy about none of this stuff. Well, I, 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 I blew, I, you know, I blew a gasket when they, when they went after that, you know, all that whole deal with that whole Bert, uh, was his name, uh, Bird doll, that damn traitor POS that they, uh, Bo Bird doll. They yeah. shouldn't have left that. They should have left that freaking traitor there. So you can have him. They you can have him. Let him rot. And one of the guys that came out of Gitmo is that dude. Yeah, he's the head. He's the head muckamuck. Head of the he's their head muckamuck. Is one of them that yeah. they traded him for that piece of crap. And what we, made it, we've done some really stupid shit. Well, it's we not, always do. Well, I I watch this stuff, and they're like. Oh, the Americans did this, and the Americans did that, and the Americans and Americans. And I'm thinking, no, let's be correct. Joe Biden did this. Um, Barack Obama did this. Just like all that crap with, with the, the, you know, uh, the Taliban and all the, you know, Pakistani and all this crap that they, you know, held. Barack Obama created ISIS, period. They've got the books. They know he funded it. He that was his direct. He's a radical. His husband is a radical, just like he is. And Michelle is not a girl. That's a guy. And, uh, that's you know, you know. So uh, look at Joan Rivers. <laughs> she point. Hey, she called it. She called she point it. Blank, called it. Dead on the table. From a from a basic procedure, That's DOA. Shit. I saw somebody posted a meme today. Showed uh, Hillary with this scowl on her face, and the picture next to it was a was a you know body with a toe tag on a on a gurney, and it said nobody in the world has. 47 friends that committed suicide. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, and, think and about that's... it, right? Think about that. Well, and, and, and how that's many the people, thing. How many people did they know that they all committed suicide? That's there's There's got to be a story behind that. <laughs> well, just like the whole deal with Vince Foster. That's if you if you've ever looked at the deal with him, you know, they put a gun in his right hand. Well, he was left-handed. Yeah. Um, you know, it just there's so many things with the Vince Foster deal that just don't, just period, just do not add up. It's, it's like he wasn't shot there. He was shot someplace else and dumped there. With it. There's no powder residue on his hands other than what was on the pistol when they stuck it in his hand. Um, you know, it... it like you said, how many people have they personally dealt with that are committed suicide? Right. In the meantime, like, the other thing that pisses me off that General Motors is going to stop building gasoline vehicles in like what six years? Five, six well, years. Well, you know, well, you know, that was one of the first things Obama did 
you know, oh, uh, GM was big in hydrogen. Yeah. And if and if they were if they were smart, you know, if you understand anything about nuclear power, you know, nuclear is not like a switch. It's either on and producing or off and not producing. Well, at nights when the demand for power is normally low, what they do or what they the engineers were talking about. And I know this because I've got a friend that's in the power plant business and. He goes at night, he goes, they can basically just sit there and crank out the hydrogen because there's no need for the, for the, you know, it, the, the reactors running, you know, it's not like they turn it up, turn it down. It's running. It's wide, wide open. And it, at night they, he goes, they can produce so much hydrogen. And then during the day when they need power, they switch off the hydrogen production back into power generation. GM was, if you remember, GM was big into hydrogen. Yeah, but that's first thing dangerous. Obama. One of the first things Obama did when he got in there to hydrogen. They they just passed uh, here in uh, D.C. and I'm sure it's going to be coming. But all land all landscaping company has to use battery power, no gas powered mowers or cutters. Yeah, yeah. When does that start? The next year. You gotta be kidding me. No, I got, I got, I got four, I got three really big landscaping companies that I go to, and they're now all converting over to uh, battery powered uh, equipment instead of gas. What are they gonna do with trucking? That's well, like I said. The crap that I go through with my with my uh, for my emission stuff is just brutal. I mean, my old truck never had a problem in 16 and a half years driving that truck. It might have been ugly, but it got me where I needed. It only missed one week of work when the transmission went up, and it took me a week to rebuild it and put it back in. And I mean, I just got done spending twenty eight hundred dollars, and I was seven weeks down waiting for parts for my D for my truck. Yeah, I just, you know, it's. And actually, it's funny, it's Vince, crazy. that you said that because my truck runs better with a check engine light on than when it's off. So <laughs> that's why <laughs> it's supposed to be. But eventually what happens is it's on a counter and then it does start to reject. I mean, decline. I mean, and then I get my low power check. I got three different check engine lights. The first one's OK. But then I get the one with the one arrow going down, and then I get the color change, and then I get the flashing, and then you're fucked. So derate, de yeah, yeah. They you that's get, why you I want to get rid of gasoline. Uh, it's yeah. really. What are people that don't have money going to do? You ain't buying a you know, five hundred dollar electric car. Ain't happening. Well, this is the separation of the of the of the masses. This is the haves gonna, and the have-nots. Totally destroy this country, and it's going to yep. be a it's going to be a majority of people got zip. Yep. Can't get to work. Can't do nothing because you can't buy nothing. Cause there's nothing to buy. Jo you know? John, how many how many of these buy how many here, th pay here, used car places? Hmm. John, how many of these? How are you going to start? What are you going to start loading them up with Teslas? How many of these idiots do you hear, John, that talk about the democracy of America, the democracy of America? And I'm like, um, we're a representative republic. And if you're too stupid and they're not to know the difference and a true, a, democ a, tr a true democracy is, you know, mob rules. Yep. And that's what they will not. That's what they will not admit to. And that's. You know, and, and what was the uh, I forget what how the one guy used to say, but, you know, people, you know, sheeple are dangerous because they can be led. And and that's the big, you know, that the big push is, you know, wind and solar and wind and solar and wind and solar. And, you know, driving across Texas like I was doing, I can't tell you how many how many wind fields I would see in Texas. Half of them weren't running. And that's what I was doing. And the guy that I was with, he goes, when you see one like that, that stopped and the rest of them are running, 
that one's broke down. He goes, all those ones out there that are not running, he goes, they're broke down. He says, that's the only reason they wouldn't, they won't be running if, you know, other than it's they what they would cycle some of the, you know, this, this area would run and then this area would run. And he goes, but when you see like half of them running and half of them stopped and, and he goes, the ones that are stopped are broke down. I, I know that that's at one time I took a, one of the loads I took to Memphis and it was him. That's the one that uh, I had a chat with the Department of Transportation in, in Alabama there at the state line and was over the bridge weight law. And I got up there and I asked the guy, it was a, it was a 20 foot open top container. And I asked the guy, I said, what is this heavy SOB? He goes, Oh, it's a transmission for a wind for wind turbine. The thing is probably, I forget how big it was probably six by six by four and weighed about 35,000 pounds. He goes, this is a transmission for a wind tu- for one of the wind turbines. He said, straight off the boat from Japan or straight off the boat from China. Yeah. I don't know. It's ridiculous. We blew it because they never bothered to figure out like Europe did how to build nuclear power plants the right way. Well, too many people oh. watching the China syndrome with Jack Nicholas and whatever her name was. That's the cleanest you know, form of energy. That's what that's what all ninety percent of France is is nuclear. A lot of, yeah. lot well, of Germany and th- they have that technology. They use it in the subs. I mean, we have we have it. It's just that it's it's just not it's feasible for uh, for money. I mean, it's all it's all power and money, dude. Uh, you know, we, Brian. That's the nuclear. Where's the money the coming cleanest. from? If you've got most of your power plants are running on coal, where's the money coming from? Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, we have the power. Well, they have the power, and that's what it's going to be. It's going to come down to the haves and the have-nots, unfortunately, John. I know. And then there's going to be a, there's going to be a whole bunch of us in, in the middle with our Mad Max syndrome. So I, you know, I just well, uh, I guess I'll not I... put a set of monster mutters on this thing, and uh, it all it all it all goes of, back to arm- what uh... a lot of armored plate and drive through gates and take out. People. Oh, what was his name? Um, <laughs> it all goes back to Eisenhower's speech. Eisenhower warned about it how many years ago? Long time. Yeah. Ray, you look yeah. tired. I am. What I have to do is I got to go put the garbage out and lay my head down on the pillow. Yeah. Because I'm tired. What time did you get up this morning, Ray? Uh, six. Me too. Yeah. Brian? Huh? Uh, five. I got up a little before five. Oh, God. Right. You're like my wife. She gets up that early. I, I got you beat. I got you all beat. Hmm. 205. 205. Jesus. Tomorrow, tomorrow be 445. And then tomorrow be 430. I got to run credit cards. Love I running credit f- cards early in the morning. Uh, I got to <laughs> find out if the Bucks won the first game of the, day, of the season. Got up, drove. Drove one way to Morristown, Tennessee, 335 miles. Nice. Yeah. Offloaded and then turned around and drove right back 335 miles. That's it. All right. All right, guys. I'm going to go get ready to run those credit cards. Yeah. Got to warm that machine up. Yeah, go warm it. All right, it Brian, up. Get, you, get your batch reports done there and you'll be all set. <laughs> yeah, let's see if we can. Uh... Are we sure we want to end? Yes, we're going to end the plane and traffic stream tonight for Lewis Lee and Ray Guarino, Chassis John, and Matt Gomez Bright. And the return of Vince. Vince, yes. Seen Vince forever. So, 